you all know, we're compromising military affairs and continuing our discussion about minimum wage. Good to see, see you all here. Um, before we get going, we'll, we'll introduce ourselves. I'm Tom Collinhead, rep from South Burlington and chair of the committee. Tom Stevens, um, rep from Waterbury. Deanna Gonzalez from Winooski. Vicki Strong from Albany. Tommy Waltz from Paris City. Brian Smith from Derby. Kevin Coach Christie from Hartford. Heidi Sherman from Stowe. Ed Reed from Faces. Mary Howard from Rutland City. Um, and uh, committee assistant Ron Wild will be running the, the tape for us to preserve the record today. Um, <coughs> And we'll ask people to come up to this chair to um, address us so that we can have it recorded. And um, starting with uh, Wes Hamilton. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks. Uh, Wes Hamilton, the, uh, one of the owners of uh, three Penny Tap Room near Montpelier, as well as the Matt Taco. Um, we have a catering company as well. Uh, I apologize, I've been dealing with um, email and, and internet issues for the past two days. And I, I didn't have the chance to prepare what I would hope to prepare, but um, I, think, I think I can just speak. Uh, I'm, I'm strongly in favor of increasing the minimum wage. I uh, personally wish we were talking about a livable wage right now instead of $15 several years from now. Um, I think that um, just personally, I, if the economy does not work for everybody and doesn't afford uh, a comfortable and dignified life for everybody, uh, I, I don't know the purpose of the economy. Uh, and I know that the easy counter is often a business owner like me who feels that way should increase our wages. Um, much as I testified the same uh, for, for the paid sick leave bill a couple years ago, um, if I choose to increase those benefits, uh, to increase wages substantially um, over what my competitors do, uh, puts me at a pretty severe disadvantage. My prices have to increase um, to cover those costs, and um, then uh, you may or may not be aware the, the Vermont uh, restaurant industry is thriving and tight and very competitive. Uh, so, so very often the difference between coming to my place for a burger or going down the street for a burger is a dollar on the menu. Um, So just the same as with my competitors, we all pay rent, we all pay our water bill, um, we all pay the cost for our product. I feel very strongly that um, if we are all on a level playing field of being a, we're required to carry insurance, if we're required to um, pay a minimum threshold for our workers, which we are now, it just happens to be not enough for them to get by. Um, then, uh, you know, that, that puts us all at the same foot. Um, I, my computer's not working, so I don't have what I'd hope to have, but um, I have run some kind of just rough ballpark numbers, even, um, you know, that, that approximately 33% increase from the current minimum wage to the $15 um, it doesn't look like a 33% increase on the menu. It looks much, much smaller than that. Uh, the, the cost doesn't translate directly. Uh, so I don't think that that's, um, you know, that, that slight increase in, in what we would have to charge, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't bear out in some kind of massive inflation as far as, as what it looks like to me. Um, and then has the added bonus of more people can afford to go out to dinner or can afford to go out to the you know, local toy store or wherever else um, because they have more, more income. Uh, that's just what makes sense to me. Um, 
I know that uh, business leaders um, and, and um, uh, you know, commerce groups and, and all like to, um, uh, they, what do they like to do? <laughs> um, uh, they, uh, they like to um, talk about our taxes are too high and that we should have lower taxes. And, um, well, a part of our taxes pay for the welfare programs that prop up people who don't make enough to live. Um, so I, 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 get, um, I get pretty cynical and grumpy when I hear people don't want livable wages and also don't want taxes to pay to support our neighbors who have to buy food and put clothes on their kids. And, um, you know, that doesn't even get into being able to buy a toy for your kid or, or take yourself out to dinner. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's I mean, just the gist of it. I, I think it's, it's a moral issue. I think, um, I think it's, a, it's smart economics. The rest of the world has figured it out, seemingly. Um, and and I, I see 15 uh, by 2024 as a very, very small step towards eventually having a more compassionate and sustainable Vermont. Representative Stevens. Can you talk a little bit just about how many people in your restaurant work for minimum wage and where they, and, you know, where they fall in, in the spectrum of, of, of employees? But also, um, one of the things we don't talk about or we haven't talked about much is replacement costs. Um, if, if, someone can, if someone is moving in and out of, of those slots that, and you have to train somebody new, how do you account for that in terms of your bottom line? And, and, and would it make a difference if somebody stayed on for weeks or months or years longer? Yeah, uh, between the three restaurants um, and the catering company, I have uh, about 60 mostly full-time, some full-time employees, probably about another dozen uh, you know, seasonal employees uh, for, for the wedding season. Very few people we pay a minimum wage. Uh, I'm gonna say there's maybe about six, eight, um, and they're dishwashers. Dishwasher is always the low man on the totem pole, unfortunately, in the restaurant industry. Um, and the it's also uh, that's where our turnover is, but that's nearly a hundred percent of our turnover. Um, yeah, maybe it's. 75% of it, but, but um, dishwashers, dishwashers. Uh, they come and they go and, um, you know, if we could afford to pay them better, I, mean, I gladly would, that's part of why I'm here, um, the, the costs of training are, are, are steep, generally you have an extra person on, instead of, <clears throat> pardon me, instead of three people in the kitchen that day, you have a fourth person because somebody has, because somebody's training. Um, uh, the, the way the industry works, um, it is easier and cheaper to train a dishwasher than it is a chef or a cook or a line cook. Uh, so we prioritize paying them better. Um, like I mentioned, the, the, the restaurant industry in Vermont is thriving and booming. Uh, means the competition for skilled labor, especially in the kitchen, is, is, is tight, which means we have to pay as best we can. Um, we, we take a lot, of, I take a lot of pride in uh, being generally above industry norms in what we pay. It also results in a livable wage for, you know, not at best half, half my staff, but, but not <coughs> half um, But yeah, the, the costs of the, the people who make glass, in my case, more, more often than not dishwashers, um, they don't stick around. Uh, I have bartenders, um, I have line cooks uh, at Matt, Matt Taco who have been with us for six, seven years, and bartenders at three years <coughs> have been with us since we opened nine years ago. Uh, those, those are not very common things in the industry, and I like to think in part it's because I'm a nice guy, um, but probably more, more so it's because we pay better than most. 
Representative Reed. Thanks, um, so, so you you think now the minimum wage is too low and it should go higher, but you have guys at minimum wage. So why do you feel it's necessary for the legal minimum wage to increase before payment? I mean, you, you can pay them whatever you want. Yeah, um, and the, the higher our payroll is, then, you know, at the end of the day, eventually that had, we've been, uh, for about a year now, um, doing a pretty thorough cost-saving audit um, for everything else. Uh, we're working with Efficiency Vermont, we're, we're going through our linen bills, we're trying to squeeze every savings we can in order to push the wages up as high as we can. Um, at some point, there's no more we can do for savings, and so then that has to be reflected on our menu pricing. Um, and then it becomes a very tight walk between you know, the prices go up, so then people are going to come in less because they can go around the corner and get a beer or, 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 or get a burger uh, because our prices are higher. Um, All right, well, I guess I'm kind of confused, but, but you're advocate, advocating for raising it. Yeah, because then everybody's prices go up. If just my prices go up, um, then you don't have to come to three grand to get a burger. You can go to Positive Pie to get a burger for maybe two dollars cheaper because maybe they choose to pay minimum wage okay. and, and we're looking for the income for paying somebody fifty dollars or whatever. All right. So, but in theory, there, I mean, the way it's tied in now to the, uh, the, the inflation index, it would be the same level playing field all the way up anyway. Well, it's currently the same level playing field for just in terms of right. we all have the same level right. wage. Well, what I'm saying is <coughs> the, way, the way it's tagged now is it goes, it, it's raised each year. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this would just accelerate it. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm saying is no matter what way, what way you went there, whether it stays the same now or in this bill accelerated, the, the, the playing field will be level for everybody. Yes, yeah, I mean, that's, that's true, and, and so I, I guess what I'm advocating for is, is that the, the, uh, the more aggressive increase, um, I, if, if I could, I would pay everybody, you know, a minimum of $18. I think a livable wage is important. Um, that would be significant costs on my end, which means my, my menu would be more expensive than every, all my competitors, which means I would lose business and then probably go out of business. And so that's, that's why I think legislating the increase rather than um, leaving it to individual business owners is, is important. Representative Schumer. Uh, just as a follow-up, because I, I, I'm kind of confused as well. Um, it doesn't, by doing this though, and you, you're obviously admitting this, that prices will go up, prices will go up all over the place everybody's prices are going to go up. So the purchasing power of the individual is still going to be the same as it is right now. Um, so why, how, how does $15 change the purchasing power if all of the prices are going to go up to pay for that $15 across the board, especially in restaurants where you are the last, last rung on the ladder of, or the, the uh, you know, of, of the product, of the cost of product. Um, so, I mean, how does the purchasing power of somebody, whether, so we, we could say the same thing at $30 an hour or $5 an hour, like it's, prices are going to go up or they're going to go down or they're going to stay the same, I guess, so I guess that's my question. How does the purchasing power? Yeah, well, I, I, I hope that uh, there's um, somebody testifying who's an actual economist because I, I'm not, <laughs> yeah. um, but, um, $15 an hour is, you know, that's almost 30, 33% increase for that minimum wage employee. To cover that overall in my payroll costs, you know, maybe my, my prices have to go up 10%. So, it, you know, it's not a, a, a penny, a dollar for a dollar um, across the board increase. Yeah, to pay for that labor cost, but what about the product cost increase? Because everybody else is gonna be paying. You know, the driver for Farrell is gonna be, oh, uh, you know, to get the product to the, I mean, the products are going to go up. Everything goes up. So I guess I would just challenge, I would just 
I, I guess I, I don't expect you to answer necessarily. I know you're not. Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 from what I've looked at and what I believe, um, it's just it's not part and parcel. Uh, I think the benefit. I think there's there's ample studies and evidence and whole continents who pay pretty good base wages and uh, you know it, 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 I haven't seen any you know just um, the sky is falling or anything it seems to work out but uh, you know I'm a high school dropout I don't, I'm a, I don't have an economist <laughs> <laughs> in any kind of economics <laughs> Three Penny, Mad Taco, and what's the third? Well, we have two Mad Taco locations, and then uh, we also run a, a catering company, okay. uh, Cast Iron Catering. Okay, and one, one is in the Mad River. Correct. And then one's here in Montpelier. Correct. Great food. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Smith. Morning. Good morning. Uh, do you routinely really give your, well, how many, let me, let me back up a second. How many employees do you, do you have working? Uh, about 60. Do you routinely give them raises when they deserve it? Uh, yes. Uh, that almost exclusively in the kitchen. You know, mm -hmm. the bartenders and, and wait staff are, are, sure. are, are they're, they're sure. giving on tips. Sure. Do what, do you, what do you feel about having that opportunity taken away from you and being mandated? Uh, well, I mean, there is a minimum wage right now. It doesn't feel like it's taken away from me. Sure. Okay. Good. All right. Representative Howard, the question is, um, it pertains to wages. It doesn't really pertain to minimum wage. But um, since you're a successful restaurateur, um, any losses uh, in your business, such as if um, customers walk out and don't pay the bill, um, or the server drops a tray of glassware, um, do you, uh, your loss, do you take it out of their paycheck? No. No, no I'm not even sure if that's legal, but, but I, no. Thank you, Wes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> Trace Amigos, Rusty Nail, and Stowe. I'm going to read from a script. That um, hello, board. My name is Mark Fryer. Some of you might recognize me from my testimony last year. I am part owner of the Reservoir Restaurant in Waterbury, the Bench Restaurant in Stowe. And as of last fall, Trace Amigos, the Rusty Nail, and Stowe. My partner and I finished last year employing around 150 people, up from 100 the year previous. I applaud your efforts and conversations around minimum wage. Affordability in this state is a real challenge and one I hope you continue to focus on. Affordability can be approached from many different angles. For my business, much surrounds menu prices and the ability to stay profitable on an ever-changing Vermont landscape. Today I'm here asking the board to take time to focus on discussing tip minimum wage and why I truly believe tip minimum wage should be uncoupled from minimum wage <coughs> to flat. Employers are required to get employees to minimum wage if they do not earn it through tips. Even by uncoupling tip to non-tip wages, no employee should earn less than minimum wage. Let me repeat, keeping tip minimum wage flat or keeping it coupled, no employee should earn less than the current minimum wage. By coupling tip minimum wage to minimum wage, it is giving a raise to all wage earners no matter what their final take home pay is. As you can see from my data below, back of house, kitchen, hourly employees earn significantly less than front of house, hourly employees in my business. This disparity in earnings is real and uncoupling will help to level the playing field if minimum wage continues to rise. I support a higher minimum wage, but understand that most likely ramifications will be a cost shift up for back of house labor. Earners at $15 today will expect to earn more than someone just starting. 
and I fully expect my cost of goods to increase because we buy a lot of Vermont products, produce, proteins, beer, spirits, etc. And we use many Vermont companies, distributors, service companies. The easiest response to these cost increases is to increase my menu prices, which will most likely increase the wages for front of house tipped employees, since tips are typically a percentage of price. But remember, since tipped wages are coupled in the current proposed bills, employers would see an automatic increase in the front of house labor. Even though my front of house employees are earning well into the $20 an hour range, these tipped employees would see a higher base pay and most likely higher tips. No other business with non-tipped wages well into the $20 range plus range would be asked to spend more on their employees under this bill, but I would. Last year, my restaurants averaged around 16,000 hours of tipped wages per location, a move from $5 an hour, that's a 2017, to $750, would increase my labor costs by around $40,000 per year per restaurant. This does not include the other increases to back of house labor and cost of goods stated above. Giving a raise to employees that are not asking for it and ultimately making my menu prices even higher. My first two restaurants operate around 8 to 10% profitability and, the, and about a third of that is labor cost. Large changes in labor costs cut hugely into profits. My new restaurant was previously a nightclub and is not profitable yet. The previous business had mostly weekend hours and employed only a handful of people. With the use of tip minimum wage, we're able to create a staff of around 50, half of which earn tipped wage. Tips are earned whether my restaurant is profitable or not. Some will say, why should a customer pay for a business's wages? My response is, what business doesn't do this? Other businesses just build it into price. Service companies, retail stores all set prices based on their estimated labor costs. We would probably have to consider a service charge type model if tip minimum wage continues to rise. But then it puts us what used to be tip dollars in the hand of the employer. We would do everything we could to pass that income to front of house, but there's no guarantee other businesses would. We would also have to set a front of house wage, which would most likely lower gross take home wages for many of my employees. Other restaurant models are starting to pop up in other markets in Vermont that move to counter service. These restaurants eliminate servers and the food is served on paper products, eliminating back of house jobs like dishwashers. I now employ over 150 people. I care about their jobs. I care about their wages and I continue to enjoy employing a significant number of people in Vermont. I want to see Vermont an affordable place to dine for the local and the tourist. Um, it also keeps us competitive against neighboring states. Many of my employees have children, some even own homes. I'm going to continue to work hard to make sure the legislature understands the impacts of these new laws. In Maine, it took the servers banding together to fight the higher tipped wages passed previously. They were able to get the law reversed and actually lowered. And I included um, for my restaurant in Waterbury, the average non-tipped salary earner, so this is basically back of house, earned around $12 an hour. That doesn't include uh, salary employees. Uh, the average tipped wage earner earned $24.56 an hour, including the base wage. I had 21 females and seven males last year that earned tipped income. The average female made $25 an hour. The average male made $23 an hour. <laughs> And I included an article about uh, why New York's currently in a situation where there's talk about getting rid of the tip credit and why there's a fight against it. And I also included an article about the main uh, server banding together to fight higher tip minimum wage. Thank you. Representative Chen. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. Just quickly, can you? What did you just say about New York there? Um, there's a push in New York to eliminate the, what's called the tip credit, so the differential between minimum tip minimum wage and minimum wage, so basically putting them at a flat wage with no incremental difference in... So they'd be at the regular minimum wage in New York? Yeah, correct. Um, so how does that relate? So, and then... Because um... right now we're talking about coupling, but I, I know that there's also bills that have been presented that eliminate it completely. Yeah. So I want to make sure that 
I want to make sure that there's an understanding on how the minimum wage works. So I, I believe it is actually a really good thing for Vermont and jobs. And as the coupling continues and the cost of that tipped wage goes up, I really think there's going to be pushback against that. And it's either going to be counter service models or there's going to be service models. If, say, all of a sudden someone's like, well, if that's not working, we're just going to get rid of it completely and we're just going to get rid of tips. And I, I honestly think that that's going to be a decrease for a significant number of people in wages because it'll just become an hourly wage that we set as employers and potentially put more money in our pocket and less money in the pockets of the front house. And if you look at some of the data, my highest earning tipped employees are in the $30 an hour range. There's no way that we would be most it likely paying that the in the future. So I, I, I'm trying to protect the strength of those wages and understand that if the coupling continues, it's just continuing to accelerate this disparity between this back of the house labor and the front of the house labor. I had a cook come to me this week and basically gave him an ultimatum. He gave me an ultimatum that he wanted to be in the front of the house because his girlfriend works in the front of the house and I'm sure they talk about how much they're making. <coughs> she's making more than he is and we can't pay that right to the end of the high so, 20s. Okay, that, that actually, thank you, because um, there was a, a server in Stowe who talked about that to me, that <coughs> was concerned about um, <coughs> losing tips, um, losing their, um, and that they make a pretty good, obviously, the wage, uh, uh, take home anyway. Uh, so. Yeah, I mean, a lot of my employees um, have children. They, with these wages, they don't typically work 40 hour work weeks. They, they work three days a week. They can earn a pretty solid wage and be home with their families. So there's a lot of people that find this uh, a pretty nice lifestyle. What other benefits do you offer the tip wages, you know, especially the part timers and whatnot? You, you do health care, you do. 401k do you do? We don't do 401k, we do offer health care at all three restaurants. Um, we also <laughs> offer pay time off, um, which they earn over time. Um, and then in the sorry, what was the last? Pay time off they earn over time. Um, and they also have uh, discounts on meals and that kind of stuff. So with the paid time that's, that's basically just started to, to kick in, how are you finding that with your employees in terms of call outs and in terms of um, I mean, we've heard a lot about potential abuse of the system, and uh, it, now that it's now that it's um, operational, what are you finding? We were doing it previously already, just to try to be competitive in the marketplace. I think Wes is correct in saying that it's a highly competitive market right now for um, employees, especially in the back of the house in Vermont. So anything that we can offer to try to get a leg up, so. Nothing has really changed from us. It just became formalized on a state level, but we were doing it already anyways. Many uh, employees are, are using it, um, but we're happy to, to offer it and, and use it. And, and incrementally, that cost is, isn't, to me, significant over the entire P&L of the restaurant. And just one last, so to be clear on the tip minimum wage, you're, you've been clear that you support the minimum wage increasing, but because you have to meet it anyway. So this tip, the, for you, the tip minimum wage is, I don't want to say irrelevant, but it's, you have to always make that tip minimum wage uh, up to the minimum wage if, if they have a bad week. Correct, I mean, the, the, that forced increase is gonna most likely mean that we're gonna raise prices. And I think at any, t any level restaurant, say it's a successful restaurant or a restaurant that's barely getting by, the restaurant that's barely getting by most likely has pretty low tipped income for their employees. So if they were ever short on that two week period, they would have to make up for it. But if they have employees that are at or just above minimum wage, they wouldn't have to make up for it. So I think it's actually a protection for the low level, but it's also wouldn't be forcing us to have increased costs when we have wages at this level and we can we can work on understanding how to absorb minimum wage increases as our back of house labor and cost of goods go up. And that's that's in its in and of itself is something that we have to look at every year. But just this year that quarter increase is about four thousand dollars per restaurant increase when wages are at this level, which is a little over three hundred dollars a month. 
that those, that's a real amount of money we have to we have to look at and take seriously and decide at, at some point we'll most likely have to take a price increase. Or if we don't, or if other businesses aren't fast enough, they could cash flow out of business. Especially with how the seasons work here, you have to be very careful in terms of how you spend money and win in a restaurant. And I learned that very early. I ran out of my first restaurant. I ran out of money in the first like three months, and I was like, "Oh yeah," because you have to pay for your busiest months and your slowest months. So you have to be very careful. And it's and the restaurant I just opened in Stowe, the last the fourth quarter, which we opened in September. You know, we we since we went into a slow season, we. We're upside down about seventy thousand dollars in cash flow to try to come out of it this winter. So I mean, it's it's a tough business. It requires a significant amount of cash and an understanding of <coughs> cash flow. Um, and I think that's why you're starting to see these models of elimination of these jobs through modifying the model. You don't have those costs, and then you can price compete with other businesses. You can sell a burger at a counter, or you can sell a burger at a seated seat, and the counter service model saves a significant amount of money from a labor perspective. And that that competitiveness will get even harder as tipped income goes up. Uh, so thank you so much for your testimony and um, uh, your business has been very successful and been able to figure out ways to provide a, a good working environment and, and all these different benefits that you're able to provide. Um, which is not necessarily true for a lot of other other restaurants. And I am wondering around about sexual harassment in the workplace, and particularly around customers and, and, um, and with tipped wages. And so what is it that, that you've seen um, in your restaurant around, um, uh, around that? Yeah, I think it, it is real. Um, we haven't experienced much of it, and actually I had someone hit me up last week, and that's why I have some of this data here was, um, that question was presented to me. Um, we we have a policy that any any customer that is treating uh, employee um, to a level that we believe is un, I guess I use the word unfair. We we have a management team in place that takes it on directly. We actually do either ban uh, customers for a period of time or permanently. We have no problem doing that. Um, in terms of whether emails are seen. Uh, difference in wage, I think it's pretty clear, at least in the, the Waterbury restaurant, which I would say that had a history of being just a bar for a number of years, and it was pretty rough for years, and I, I walked into a restaurant that was pretty was pretty rough around the edges, and you know, people literally lifting people up and smashing them over a table in the first year of business, and you know, we had to, we had to address those things full on, but I mean, I think it, it takes the right management style to to show that you know there's a in terms of female male there's a significant difference in the average wages two dollar wage difference and even my highest employee is a female so I don't believe that we're seeing um, that I'm sure it does exist in in certain markets but I don't think minimum wage is where you go after something like that I think it needs to be in other forms of laws or um, something else that can be done to help report something like that for Aspen. Representative Walsh and then Strong. I thank you. I, I really appreciate what you're doing in the industry. I, but I have a question. I, I really need to be clarified on um, what you mean by uncoupling. You're not talking about making up the difference when a server doesn't make the minimum wage. You're talking about the percentage. So basically right now it's Couple to 50% of minimum wage is tip minimum wage. So if it goes to 15, minimum wage goes to 15, we would be paying $7.50 per hour no matter where wages are with our employees. I'm saying that I believe that tip minimum wage should remain flat. If tips don't reach minimum wage over a two week pay period, then we would be required to add incre increased costs. But What's happening is by keeping keeping them coupled, that two dollars and fifty cents an hour goes to employees at a restaurant like mine mm -hmm. that have wages well into the twenty dollar an hour range, which is only going to force us to additionally increase prices, which then increase additionally increase the tips because tips are a percentage of price 
which gives them an additional raise as well. So it, to me, it, it doesn't make sense to do it to do it the way we're doing it. Okay, so I I, I think I'm understanding you. This, you're only talking about that 50 percent. You're not talking about the need to make up the difference when they fall short. Yeah, we would be required to do that anyways. Right. Thank you. And and there's been question. I I I've talked about this a couple times in different committees or one on ones and. The question, I am absolutely, just like we are required to pay minimum wage, we're required to make up the difference. I believe that, that businesses should be audited. I believe businesses should be held accountable for making sure that employees are making minimum wage. I'm in support of raising those penalties or putting more people on the ground to make sure that compliance, but that's where I would rather see it spent and not hoping that by coupling it's somehow lessening that risk because I don't believe it's happening very often and what it's doing is it's just increasing costs on businesses that are really trying to survive in the Vermont place and employ as many people as they can. Okay. Represent strong. So I am trying to thank you Mark for coming and um, for the wages that you have here posted here it looks like competition itself as far as keeping good help and, and employing them and training them is helping the wages be high. Um, and I'm just wondering, you're also advocating for raising the minimum wage, am I right? And, then, and yet it could cost you in other ways, prices on your product or how you serve. So I'm trying to figure out how those both go together. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm still confused and also because, by the previous thought. Yeah, I understand the question. And, uh, and there is a confusion on how tip wage works versus so tip wage, I don't necessarily control other than we set how many tables a server might take. We try to get a server to $1,000 in sales, which we hope translates to a $200 a shift. So that's how we can kind of control income. But other than that, from there, we don't control what the customers tip. Mm -hmm. um, over the years, prices have gone up and we've had to take significant prices on everything. So that's actually giving a raise to the front of the house. The back of the house, we, similar to how Wes was describing it, we, there is, the time that we start to, to increase wages in the back of the house is when we need to be more competitive in what's in the marketplace and how difficult it is to find employees. But our dishwashers typically start at the 10 to $11 range. Um, so the, the, the the employees that don't earn tips, we work for minimum wage. And I do believe that that needs to come up over time that we can understand, not on a crazy accelerated schedule, but I do believe that those wages need to come up. And then, like the question that happened earlier, we, we could try to do that, but the problem is then we would be, our pricing would be completely different from our competitors. And, you know, for example, in the Waterbury market, I have four or five other restaurants selling burgers right next to me, so I have to be price competitive as well. So I, minimum wage can come up, my back of house employees go up, my cost of goods start to rise. I, I most likely would respond to that by increasing prices, but if you uncouple tip minimum wage, I don't have an automatic cost increase for every single tipped hourly employee in the front of house. Hmm. And their wages are well above twenty dollars an hour, and I think that's a very livable wage in Vermont right now. Mark, thank you. Oh, Representative Howard. Yeah, I asked the same question I asked the previous witness. Do um, are your uh, servers uh, punished if they break glassware or if customers walk out and they are? No, they're not. So we we would never consider doing that. We've actually we very rarely. Do we have walkouts? Um, but even, and this isn't something that I think would make sense for a lot, but remember when they walk out, there's no tip. And we've actually thrown money at a server to cover that difference, understanding that that's part of their wage and that they didn't get that. But I think that's something we decided to do personally. I wouldn't expect to see that at every restaurant, but we'll even do that. But losses like a dropped plate or something like that, we would never, we would never consider charging our employees for. Do you do um, do any of your restaurants participate in, in tip pooling? No, we don't, we don't participate in tip pooling. And I don't believe tip pooling is necessarily in itself a bad thing, um, as long as the rules of 
typical in our followed, which is 85. We we do have tip outs, right? So employee, employees would tip out a food runner and that kind of thing. But ultimately, the rule is is that 85 percent of those tips needs to stay with that tipped employee. In tip pools, I think it gets a little bit sometimes questionable whether or not they're getting their full 85 percent. Um, but we don't we don't participate in tip. And none of that money can go to back the house or managers as a rule currently in that. Um, most restaurants, as far as I understand, follow that rule. And, and just one last, in terms of figuring out the, the averages, what is the percentage now of, of cash tips versus plastic tips, which are harder, which are easier to follow? Yeah, we're well above 80% uh, credit card. In Stowe, we're closer to 90%. So most of our business is with the credit card. So we have visibility to most of the tips, but yeah, that is true that that's only what we have visibility to. So there is some cash that we don't have visibility to that isn't reflected in that. And they're required to declare something. They're required to declare something, but we don't have full visibility on this. I, I, I don't know how you would necessarily be able to do that. But we, we do try, we encourage, and we do, at minimum, they need to, they need to report the credit card tips. Um, but if we start to see that on a regular basis, we make sure that they understand that they need to be claiming cash as well. Thank you. Mark, thank you. Yep, thank you. It's not straightforward, simple, or linear. It has a, a number, of, number of complexities and nuances to it, all of which I think are within your control as legislators to address. Um, a bit of history is always good, I think, to set the stage for, for the debate. Uh, if you go back in history to the 40s and 50s, 60s in this country, minimum wage was anchored to worker productivity and low and semi-skilled workers saw wages as did other workers in this country uh, go up uh, as productivity went up and workers were able back then uh, to be fully engaged members uh, of their community they were able to do things like buy cars and buy homes and have a standard of life and living that you know most people ascribe to Late 60s, that began to shift for any number of reasons, and it wasn't until 1974 in a, a amendment to the Fair Labor Standards Act, believe it or not, championed by that great liberal thinker, uh, Richard Nixon, um, that workers in this country saw a 40% increase in the minimum wage. Um, we had a retreat from that over the years, <coughs> and once again, we saw minimum wage for those people at kind of the low and semi-skilled wages um, stagnate and everything that attributed from that stagnation uh, began to happen. Um, we've been trying to address that um, three years ago. This legislature addressed that. We were part of the solution for that, staging a, an increase to the minimum wage over three years in an attempt to address it. Um, we're here again. Uh, three, four years later, still trying to address that. And I think some of the same issues that we saw then are still in place today. Um, so with that as a, a backdrop, let me give you our comments on, um, on the bill. 
The first and foremost, I think that any increase in the minimum wage that you enact needs to see a concurrent move in the benefits cliff, not just for child care, but for housing and for health care services as well. It does absolutely <coughs> excuse me, no good to increase the minimum wage and force people to have to make choices about uh, well, lose housing subsidies, lose child care subsidies. Now, the Senate bill begins to address the child care subsidy to a degree uh, as funds are available, but does nothing to address the housing subsidies, which are very real. Uh, as chair of the board of COTS, um, we have a number of apartments now in our new COTS building for people who are um, coming out of homelessness, who have a job, and who are looking to better uh, themselves uh, and their families' lives. Those apartments, they can only stay in those apartments because of a, uh, a very uh, generous philanthropist who makes up the difference between their housing subsidies and the increases in wages that they get. Now, we're lucky, and those people are lucky but that is not a statewide policy. So as you think about moving the minimum wage, think about what you're going to do for people who are getting housing subsidies. If you lose your house, what good is the extra $10, $15 an hour? It doesn't make up the difference. The same is true for high child care. So better that you do nothing, <coughs> frankly, than to do something and actually hurt the people you're actually trying to help. Um, second, we believe, and this is from a Chittenden County perspective, that the path to $15 an hour set out in the Senate bill balances the needs of workers and the fragility of Vermont businesses from our perspective. We believe that this allows market forces, which are already increasing wages of skilled and semi-skilled trades, to continue. These forces, we see them at work in Chittenden County, in food services, hospitality, industries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, um, Vermont small businesses and industries that cannot define or dominate their markets, such as those that compete with national chains and those companies that have little control over aspects like the cost of raw materials, have to have the ability to align their business plans with the increases that you propose in the six-year rollout. Um, there's, you know, the last iteration over three years and 50 cents an hour over three years was doable. This is going to be a tougher reach for those small businesses, and we, it's a steeper hill to climb, and I think some sort of carve out for those types of businesses, especially those that compete with national chains, um, should be considered. Um, seasonal workforce, let me address that. Speaking to our members who hire large seasonal workforces, summer and winter recreational businesses in particular, it is their strong belief that there must be a carve-out for them, given their lack of elasticity in prices. And we heard that from the previous gentleman about restaurants. The result of mandating large annual increase will unquestionably, undoubtedly, undeniably result in future hires. You can only charge so much for a lift ticket, and you can only charge so much for a bed or a head in the bed. Um, so you're either going to hire fewer people, in that seasonal workforce. These are the people who are looking to get a second income, make a little bit of extra money, or we're going to go to what my union friends euphemistically call robo-scales. Um, you, you see them in all your supermarkets, they're the, you know, the self-checkout. You'll see, begin seeing more and more use of technology in uh, ski areas and other places, and uh, fewer and fewer seasonal hires. Again, providing an economic uh, disincentive and lack of a benefit for those folks. Um, finally, I will echo what the uh, last speaker uh, said. Uh, this chamber is unalterably opposed to coupling the minimum, tip minimum wage with the minimum wage. It's illogical, it makes no sense, um, and uh, it only is going to hurt those people um, who the restaurants in this previous gentleman, I think, was a good example, that those restaurants want to help your, your cooks, your back-of-the-house staff. Uh, as one restaurant owner said to me, um, you know, my service make up to $40 an hour. You know, I would rather give that extra $2.50 an hour to my cooks, my bottle washers, and those folks than to give it to 
have to put it into the base wage of a server that I know is going to skyrocket past $15 an hour. Uh, and it's illogical because those, for those restaurants, unlike mine in Chittenden County, which I will admit some of my restaurants are different than the ones you'll find in other corners of the state, <coughs> they still have to get the $15 an hour on average over a two-week period or else it has to be made up. So I, it, it doesn't, I've heard the one-off stories of, of, you know, of this employer with, you know, this, this tip staff is afraid to say something to their employer because they're afraid they're going to lose their job. Um, it's not my experience that that is true. It's not my experience that the vast majority of Vermont employers act that way um, towards their employees and those that do act that way towards their employees and punish them for asking what is lawfully and rightfully theirs, I think should be prosecuted. Um, but I don't think you should make laws for the one or two bad apples in a very large barrel. That's our testimony. Take any questions you might have. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> um, so you know she's my boss. Yeah, no, I, uh, fully, I, I, I fully understand that I, yeah. <laughs> I'm used to getting pilloried, so I figured I'll go to the first one. Oh, good. So, um, if, so if I have this straight, that you're advocating for this $15 an hour minimum wage increase over six years. But for carve outs for seasonal businesses and smaller rural businesses? Um, I'll let you decide how you want to handle smaller rural businesses. I, my perspective is from Chittenden County, um, you know. My pizza delivery drivers and my members are making 12 50 an hour today. Yeah. My servers are making a lot more money than that. It's already occurring organically in six years. What my board, what my executive committee, what my membership told me in six years, they're gonna be at $15 an hour plus. So I do not, I, I think there are others from other chambers and other regions here that can speak more eloquently to the rural areas. I can't tell you about the Meadowy Valley or Sure. Or what's happening in Bennington? It's just not my my bailiwick. So, what do you think would make sense to look at this as more of a Burlington thing yeah. than the state? I think that there are examples around the country where they have looked at New York State. It's a good example where they have looked at uh, regionalization. I and there are much larger states than ours. Uh, I can't tell you if that model works well for Vermont because we're not New York State. We're not that, we're not New York City, Utica, Buffalo, and God knows where else in Europe. Um, those places that we compete with for jobs that we don't like to mention. Um, so I don't know if it makes sense. And I don't know if it's Burlington specific or county specific. I think it actually requires um, some deliberation. Um, but generally, you know, can we get in most industries the 16 to $15 an hour over six years, yes, without breaking the bank, yes. I think there are industries in the, uh, where that's going to be difficult in different parts of the state because they don't have the same labor market pressures that we have in Chittenden County. It's a bit more. I have a, a very small restaurant and not one of the glitzy ones that are paying their cooks 20 bucks an hour because if you want a good cook or a decent cook, you're going to pay 20 bucks an hour. That's not Chittenden County, actually. That's a member outside the county. So. Uh, that's not a, a very clear answer to your question, but I, I think no, 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 no. <laughs> thank you, Representative Sherman, for, for uh, telling me that. Uh, I, I think it's something to look at. I think generally, fifteen dollars an hour as a baseline state wage makes sense, and you can get there over six years. I think there are some parts of the state where that is going to result in hardships for businesses and therefore for employees. I agree. Thank you. I guess I'll, I'll just give ask it straight out. Do you support this bill? I'm I giving you an opportunity because there's been a lot of stories. The chair of the committee came in and said you guys support the bill. Do you guys support the bill as it came we out? We support the, the bill with the, with the changes that I have just said, and I've been clear. As it came out of the Senate, do you support the bill as it came out of the Senate? I will answer that by saying I support the bill that came out of the Senate with the caveats that I have just expressed that you have to address, and that was in my testimony in the Senate. Don't do it unless you do the benefits cliff. And if you don't do the benefits cliff, don't do it. And they didn't do it. Well, then you have an opportunity. 
to, as this political process, you know better than I, you have an opportunity to fix that piece in a House bill and argue the, the logic of not doing something that's going to hurt the people. So, so I would, would you support a tax increase to pay for these um, um, uh, subsidies that we would be for that we have to make up the nine million? You know, I'm going to go back to the comments that I've made for years and years and years. When you have a budget that's in the billions, because you know, I remember starting when we were trying to get to five sixty-three, and that was a million. So you're in the billions of dollars of state budgets. There's there's money that can be um, found and reappropriated, reallocated to priorities. If this is your priority, if this is the legislature's priority and the administration's priority to take care of the most troubled and disadvantaged, low-skilled, unskilled workers, then there's money in the budget to find. I don't believe in you tax increases. I'm not a big tax guy. I'm a spend guy, but we raise enough money in the state. Okay. Representative Stevens, you were talking about the, the well. First of all, the robo scabs. You, know, you like that term? I, 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 I kind of do. I, I kind of do, but I also recognize that businesses that would use those would do that regardless of what their labor costs are. Um, oh, our, we're going to disagree on that, but so that we got we well. I'm going to the, use the example of our local supermarket that yeah. that put these in yeah. for a year mm -hmm. to come out. Mm -hmm. You know, because because the cost of them, while cheaper, took away from the human interaction of uh, of the, of a service of a service industry, which was uh, which was our local supermarket. Um, so there was this, there was just this idea of whether it goes all the way in terms of the lowest service jobs, but the, the next step up were seasonal workers. Um, I read reports where the seasonal workers you see this past winter had a harder time finding people at the existing wages because the existing wages were fairly low, and there is that competition at that level as as the restaurateurs have been talking about. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't a higher minimum wage at the very least? I mean, it's a minimum wage. Would it not attract more people to those to those jobs? Um, I think there are a lot of things that go into that. One thing that goes into that is the uh, abysmal um, uh, foreign visitor, foreign worker policy that's been enacted under this administration that limits the number of uh, H-2B visas uh, for folks to come in uh, and work uh, in those industries. Um, I think if you artificially increase the minimum wage for part-time seasonal employees, not for full-time employees, but part-time seasonal, um, you're going to find you know, ski areas hiring many fewer people to work in those lift attendant jobs, and you're going to find them using much more technology. Even though they're deploying technology now, uh, you're going to find them hiring fewer people. I hear that from my members in the ski industry, that this, this will lead them to necessarily hire fewer people in those jobs because they can't afford it and the elasticity, believe it or not, in ski tickets uh, is not infinite, even though it seems to be infinite with uh, if you bought a lift ticket recently. And just generally speaking, we, we were talking earlier about um, replacement costs. Do you guys have a, do you guys assign a percentage of what it costs to replace an employee at any, at any wage level, like how much how much should you budget if you're replacing employees at the lowest level? I, you know, I don't have uh, I don't have a number. I could get you from various members a number because they all know that this is how much it costs to onboard, this is how much it costs to train, this is how much it costs to other things. And I can hear that, but I don't have a number that I would state to the, to the committee. If you could, you yeah. know, because that, I mean, coming from, coming from especially from Chinon County, that would be very useful for our conversation. Let me ask you, if you don't mind, um, service, what type of employee? Unskilled, semi-skilled, cook, bottle washer, what are you looking we're for? We're talking at this, you know, at Got basically it. at this level, this is what we're talking about is minimum wage. I mean, I know I can say for a white collar worker, it's going to cost two months salary, three months salary, four months salary, yep. whatever, the, whatever the industry. But for this, for this industry, you know, for the service industry, I guess, you know, for people who are paying the, the ten fifty mm -hmm. to twelve fifty dollars an an hour now, yep. that would be great. Okay. You know, I just one point. Um, maybe maybe I'm being redundant. If I do, I, I apologize. Um, 
back to the benefits cliff, you know, I have one um, employer, Chittenden County employer, but it has staff located around the state because of the type of service industry um, that they perform. They're having a hard time getting their workers, who are very good workers, to work additional hours and take raises because of what that's going to do to their housing subsidies. Uh, and so they would prefer to not work, to stay and continue, not to move into a supervisory role, et cetera, et cetera, because of the subsidy piece. So back to, you know, I, I don't have an answer for Representative Sherman in terms of what tax would I support increasing or do I, I don't support increasing taxes. But it's a really, it's a real issue. Um, because that was a real life example of employees who live in Barry who won't take additional uh, work or um, responsibilities because it's going to um, screw up their housing subsidies. And I just think that's wrong as a matter of public policy. Do you happen to know whether those subsidies are federal subsidies or I state subsidies? I do not. Subsidies? It is housing subsidies. Um, Representative Christie? Um, thanks, Tom, for uh, you know, coming today. Um, being that Vermont is primarily a service oriented uh, economy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, based on you know, a lot of factors. There's still a lot of um, the small individual uh, storefronts mm -hmm. you know, in our downtowns, especially. Um, how is that affecting, uh, or I should say, how would this affect? those environments, um, at, at least in Chittenden County. Um, it would be interesting to get that uh, demographic perspective, you know, the one or two employees, uh, they're opening you know, from 9 o'clock in the morning until 9 or 9 or 8. Again, I'm always, it is in Chittenden County, maybe a Burlington issue, um, my small members who run those types of stores, call them boutiques, call them little shops. In six years, they'll get there. You know, you there's enough of a wide path. It, yeah, it's going to. It, it's not going to be easy, it's, but they'll get there. And then in deliberations on the board, those voices, whether or not they were small manufacturers um, or small shops. talked a lot about, in fact, almost solely about tip wage employees as restaurant workers, but statute calls tip wage employees also hotel workers and tourist place workers. D do you have an idea of what other sectors we're talking about here? Mm. No, I was, I'm focused primarily on the restaurant sector. Um, I don't know uh, what our hotels are paying. Um, they are back of the house employees or they are, they are or who would be a tech employee in a, in, a, in a hotel in Vermont? Would be the restaurant workers. I've seen it always as the restaurant worker. I can't think, I could easily get you that information from the Convention Bureau um, of what kind of employees at hotels are actually tipped uh, folks. I, I it's not chamber, uh, chamber persons anymore. I don't know what the right term for that is these days. but. Yeah, I, I can't remember. I can't think of any other people who no, rely yeah. solely on tips, essentially solely on tips. Yeah, no, you really, you you got me there. I'm, uh, but I can, I'll ask. No, yeah, if you could get that to the subject. Yeah, <coughs> happy to do it. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. Sorry for being clear as mud on some of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone else? Um, Local Burlington Initiative called Burlington Spike for 15. 
It started um, in the summer of 2016. And um, so basically, we knew that the legislature was going to take up raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour statewide. And I lived in Burlington, and I thought, you know what, like I also did work for Bernie 2016. And one of his main policy initiatives was raising the federal minimum wage to that. Um, and then I thought, you know what, I think it would be a great idea if we could try to create a grassroots effort, Fight for 15, in Burlington to see what Burlington voters think, not to convince them of anything, just to see what they think, and then to have that information go directly to the legislature, because, you know, these are, there's a lot of reps, obviously, from Burlington, the biggest county, um, or the biggest city in the state. So, what, so basically, I love this outreach effort, um, where I helped to um, gain by part, I contacted all of the Burlington City Councilors, and um, to ask them for their support, which, to be completely honest, was not an easy task at all. There's a lot of pretty conservative, there, there are some conservative folks on the council, and I even had to convince somebody, a few Democrats in fact, why this would be helpful. Um, and thankfully it worked out very well after a month or two of trying. Um, it passed uh, in, December, in January of 2017. Um, with a vote of 10 to 2. It, we just needed seven votes to pass. Um, and Kurt Ray was the um, dissenting vote. And um, also David Hartnett recused himself as a business owner. Um, so, and then since then, um, I, and I know that um, unfortunately it didn't pass out of your committee last session. So, but I'm very glad that the Senate passed it. This, second half of the biennium and that you're taking it up now. Um, I wanted to speak specifically in regards to, um, I've done a lot of outreach to really hear from, you know, Burlington voters and also people in the state just to hear their experience. I'm also a social worker. Um, I have my bachelor's of social work. I worked for Howard Center for five and a half years. Um, and I currently work for the schools in Burlington. Um, so basically I, a lot of things, um, I've just heard one of my friends in Montpelier, for instance, um, I've seen how she struggles having a, a daughter who's about four years old, being a single parent, and relying on minimum wage. Um, I've seen how she had to rely on, you know, actually a, a housing subsidy for the last many years in order to get by. I don't know what would have happened to her if she didn't have that. And I do encourage the House to certainly, um, to certainly do something about the housing subsidy. Nobody should lose the subsidy that they have, the roof over their head, because the minimum wage increases. Um, and I'm very proud of the Senate's version of the bill. I am very, Burlington Fight for 15 is very supportive of it. Um, and I'm very proud of their work in terms of resolving the benefits cliff issue in, um, pertaining to the child care subsidy. Um, but I do encourage you, as Tom Torty said, to do something about the housing subsidy. That deserves definitely a good, a, some sort of a resolution for those people. Um, and I also, um, I love to hear different people's perspectives, including those that are different from my own. So um, I do agree absolutely, and Burlington Fight for 15 agrees with raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Um, we wanted it a lot sooner, but you know what? I do understand the plight of businesses. And I think that, um, and yes, they're going to have to increase their wages, or they're going to have to increase their prices. Um, and I think that over a six-year span is, is more doable for them than a four-year span. Um, and, but what I, and, um, and I just recently graduated from um, UVM, and before that I started my career at Howard Center. Um, and I actually, while I was in college, I was a server at three different restaurants. So it's really interesting for me to hear a lot of the, um, and I have a lot of friends who are servers um, too. So it's interesting for me to hear how a lot of restaurant owners are saying, you know, we, don't, we do not agree with paying, we don't want to pay our employees half of the minimum wage. We don't want to do that. They're already making 20 something an hour. And I'm here to tell you, that's not always true. I'm here to tell you that there, that 
you do not get the same amount of tips every single night that you work. You cannot predict who's going to come into the restaurant. You cannot predict if there's going to be an accident on the interstate and the restaurant isn't, is only going to you know, have maybe 10 people the entire night. I remember one Sunday I worked, I only made $40 in tips and I worked, I believe, six hours or maybe longer than that, $40. And I, and I also am here to tell you that um, I didn't know this when I started out. Like, I, I've heard that, oh, servers make so much money. You know, that's what a lot of people hear. So I thought, okay, well, half of the minimum wage is, at that time, I believe it was $4.25. Um, and then I multiplied, okay, well, I'm going to be working 20, you know, hours a week. So four times, that's about, you know, like a little over eight, a little over uh, 200, you know. Um, or, no, a little under 200, sorry. Um, so I was thinking, okay, well, and then plus whatever I'll make in tips. What my paychecks actually reflected was zero dollars in tips every week. Not every single week. At the most, I got $50 every week. And, at the, and that only happened, I believe, once. Um, and at two restaurants that I worked at, um, so I worked like part-time, and, but my paychecks were zero dollars. I would get direct deposit and I wouldn't get any wages. And I didn't understand why I wasn't. And then I learned that some restaurants, not all of them I will say, some of them don't pay the, their servers any wages if they make above than the current minimum wage. So I'm here to tell you that some restaurants do do, do that and it was a significant you know, back set for myself and some of my fellow employees to know wow, we don't even know what we're going to be making when we come into work. We can't even rely on the minimum wage to be making per hour. Um, half of the current. If I can ask a question, because um, I, if you're, um, I, think you're, I think you're talking, maybe these particular restaurants weren't abiding by the law, but we actually have a law in place that says that they have to match minimum wage regardless of how much anybody was making and that minimum wage is not just 425 or now 525 it would be up to whatever that actual minimum wage is so if it's an enforcement <coughs> issue that's a different issue no that's not what i'm referring to um you so said you weren't making minimum wage to, on some of those sorry I, to clarify sorry let me clarify what i was saying that i what i believe i just said is that um if i made above the minimum wage so just say if i made $15 an hour for an hour that I worked, then my employer wouldn't pay me the $4.25 plus the, because I already made $15 an hour, I need more than the $10 an hour minimum, current minimum wage for that is the standard minimum wage. So what I'm trying to, that's, uh, that's illegal. That's illegal. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, and so, and so I think that's, that's an enforcement issue. Okay, so I think so. We're so about the minimum wage. Yep. I just want to make sure. Okay, well, thank okay. you for letting me know that. And I was confused as a server, so were some of the other folks, but I'm happy to. I'm here to tell you, as a server, for over three years, that not, not all restaurants do the same thing. There was only one restaurant that I had where I was paid for my wages on a regular basis. Um, and and I and I have some servers who are my colleagues who could prove that with their zero dollars in wages for their pay steps. So I'm just saying that that's an important thing for you to know about at least. Um, it's not the main reason why I was here to talk. I just wanted to. Yes. Question, Representative. Actually, I have a bunch of questions. First off, the, uh, the Burlington vote. What, what exactly was? Sure. So um, the vote was to have a ballot advisory question on the town meeting day ballot asking Burlington voters if they support $15 an hour statewide minimum wage and to contact their state reps. Um, so basically asking, do you as a voter support this statewide? And do you, are you, will, will you contact your reps? That was essentially what it said. So it, was, um, so it was on the ballot. It was on the ballot. So the vote was 10 to 2 to get it on the ballot. So then it was on the ballot and then on town meeting day, I believe it was March 6th, 2017, that's 75% of all of the people who voted that day in Burlington voted in support of it. Okay. So um, thank you for um, reminding me of that last part. Right. Um, so that was basically just to send a message to the legislature that this is really what... Okay, so it was a non-binding thing. Yes, it was non-binding. Yeah. Um, a lot of your testimony here is you know, I feel this, I feel that, I have to tell you this, I have to tell you, do you have you done any economic analysis any, to 
or is this just um, your feelings? And oh no, I to be completely honest, I know I've never testified ever um, on the tipped minimum wage before. I'm just telling you I mean, these are my own opinions at the moment. Yeah. Just for, and all, not just my own opinions. I have a lot of colleagues that are servers who have who I've spoken to, and they have. The one issue that they wanted me to bring up today, and I have some other quick things to mention, um, was the fact that some employees don't always receive the current report. Okay. On that. And, and we've, had other, you... we've had other witnesses yeah. who explain and not come to see it. I'll give you a little advice. It, on those pay stubs, take a look at them because they take taxes out based on everything that you okay. make. So it's completely possible, and I was a tip server for a long time mm -hmm. too, back in my day that what they made with the minimum wage, they had more taxes taken out because that's also based on the tipsy declare. So it's completely possible that that, in fact, probable mm -hmm. because I don't think restaurant owners are out there trying to be illegal. Oh yeah, I don't think so either. Right, uh -huh. so that, that it's actually legitimate <coughs> when taxes taken out um, will, will render a zero balance. Mm -hmm. And that will be on the pay stubs, mm -hmm. okay? so. Um, I, I, I guess what I'm saying here is, is you need to do some detail and economic work here, some analysis to present. Okay. Um, no, uh, I, I had a few questions there to begin with, but I just wanted to help you out with, with what's going on with you and your friends. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sorry, just to clarify, this is um, mainly my colleagues. Um, I'm sorry. To, so what I, when I've done outreach, it's not just to talk to my friends. I've talked to a lot of, um, a lot of people in Burlington, and um, to, you know sometimes just people from UVM where I, you know, people who I didn't even know who were in a completely different major who had similar experiences, or people you know who I met doing outreach to the farmers market or wherever. Um, so I was just trying to relate to you, and I'm sure I don't. I, Maybe I didn't look close enough on my pay stubs, but that's really not the main reason why I was here. I'm sorry to have distracted from that. Um, I also wanted to mention that, um, um, that sometimes, which some of you may know, in, in restaurants, there can be an overstaffing issue. Um, so this happened at two of the restaurants that I worked at, and I'm talking today to mostly talk about my experience, which I think as a server, which I think is unique from the other folks who have spoken today, um, just to tell you what I've experienced and what some of my colleagues have also experienced. Um, and so normally, you know, you have, if it's a really busy restaurant, like three tables, if you, and then you're able to turn the tables quite frequently, and then there's, there can be however many servers. But if, if some reason there's more servers on the floor that night, then you only have like two tables every you know hour, which can really significantly affect your ability to make a regular a normal amount that night that you could expect on. So um, I think that that's an issue that a lot of restaurants have sometimes, and that it's something that needs to be um, I am not necessarily not necessarily addressed legislatively, but I wanted to let you know that um, the only thing that ser servers should be able to count on at least making half of the current minimum wage. I think that that just not allowing that would be a disservice to servers because there's so many unpredictable things that could happen in restaurants, um, especially in terms of volume and how many people are there to work or how many people you know aren't there to work that night. Um, so those are the two main things that I wanted to talk to you about. And um, and I hope that, um, and also, I, I was thinking also that um, being a server is, I know that you've been one, but it's an incredibly hard job. It's, it's I, to be completely honest, I would say it's somewhat comparable in terms of energy exerted as some of the other jobs that I've had working in mental health. Um, and I, Rather than getting emotionally tired, you can get extremely physically tired. And I think that it's, and I think that, and servers work for their money. As you know, you can go to a wonderful restaurant, but if you don't have good service, you're not gonna come back. And I think that it does a disservice to, to, to those servers to have them, to, to have them 
somewhat be regulated with like, oh, well, if you earn, if you do too much of a good job, then you already earn this much, so that's your bad. You know, I think that it's important to have a have half of the minimum wage. Um, that sh servers should absolutely be able to count on half of the minimum wage, and um, because I think that they should be rewarded, to be completely honest, for how hard they work, and it's not like the employer is giving them those tips. They are the ones that earned it, and they are the ones that should be able to bring it home, because again, those tips aren't always consistent. Um, so those are the two main points that I wanted to talk to you about from things that I've experienced as, as a server for three years. I'm um, not a server currently, but also as well as my colleagues and those who have done outreach to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Carrie Brown. Okay. Hello. Thank you for having me. For the record, I'm Carrie Brown, the Executive Director of the Vermont Commission on Women. And I um, appreciate the opportunity to speak about the minimum wage. Um, I provided you with some written testimony that's a collection of facts and figures, many of which I believe this committee has seen before. I will not go through all of those in detail. You, you can have this for your reference to consult as you would like to, but I do just want to make a few key points. Um, so the Commission on Women in the 54 years we've been around, we've been concerned with women's economic security for that entire time. It, this is a foundational issue for us. And one of our policy statements is that we support legislation, policies, programs, and initiatives that promote a livable income for Vermonters. And um, so under that, we are concerned with anything that's going to bring Vermonters into the range of livable income. But more recently, I think since the last time I spoke with you all about this, the commissioners looked more specifically at the idea of raising the minimum wage. And this is something that we've spent, well, um, a lot of time on over the years, but over the past six months to a year in particular, we've had quite a number of guests come in. We've, we've looked at lots of different research. We've followed very closely what the legislature has done because the commission has recognized that while uh, raising the minimum wage in on its face may seem like a quick and easy way to get more money into people's pockets. It's actually uh, potentially a bit more complex than that when we talk about the benefits cliff and when we look at the overall impact on Vermont and the economy. And so after that entire process, the commissioners then chose to vote on whether to support or not support raising the minimum wage as a tool to increase um, Vermonters' economic position, and they voted in favor of that. So while they tend not to take positions on specific bills, recognizing that bills may change, they did take a position on this issue, the specific issue. So the commission is in support of raising the minimum wage as a tool to get everybody closer to the whole income. Uh, the wages and the minimum wage in particular has a <coughs> disproportionate impact on women in Vermont. And I just want to make a couple of points about that. We already know that women in Vermont are in a somewhat more precarious financial situation than men are. And so anything that we can do to address that is going to have a disproportionate economic impact. Um, more women than men are working in minimum wage jobs nationally and in Vermont as well. If there's a national, some national economic data that says that if the minimum wage were raised to $15 by 2024, about 33% of women overall would get a raise in that. But uh, when we look at women of different races or different um, demographic groups, we see different kinds of impact. So black women would see a raise, 43% of them would see a raise. So we have an even greater impact. Hispanic women, a 38% raise. And working single mothers, 45% of them would see a raise in their <coughs> income. And this is particularly important to, um, to the commission because the benefits cliff was one of the issues we spent the most time talking about. Um, looking at the analysis that suggests that single mothers are potentially the ones who are most impacted with a loss of available income when the minimum wage goes up. And so the fact that this bill includes uh, a means by which to potentially address that is very encouraging. And it's one of the things that they didn't, 
commissioners didn't put it into their official vote, but made it very clear that any, they, they just feel extremely strongly that any raise the minimum wage has to be accompanied by some means to offset uh, any loss and benefits that may come along with that. Recognizing that it's single mothers who are mostly impacted by that. And um, I, I, just a couple other points to make that you know, we're very concerned with the, the wage gap, the difference in earnings between men and women. And national analysis shows that a, a higher minimum wage is linked to a lower gap between men and women. And I think that may be part of what accounts already for the smaller gap that we see in Vermont between men and women. We have a higher minimum wage already than <coughs> many other states. Um, and then the, uh, the getting back to sort of related to the benefits cliff issue, when we see a raise in earnings for single mothers, especially we see uh, potentially lower impacts on public assistance in other areas. So that is a complex economic problem for you all to work out to make sure that, that we see a savings at the same time as you're trying to offset any kind of loss in benefits. But um, I believe that overall, there's potential there to see that savings and that, that uh, strengthening of the economic situation of women and families in the world. Representative Gonzalez. So we've been talking about the tip minimum wage um, this morning, and uh, my understanding from the research is that when there is, the tip minimum wage is a less of a percent than the minimum wage, there's an increase in sexual harassment. So I'm wondering if that is something that you all have, have looked at, of the differences between the states, and, and you also mentioned women of color, and, and since uh, people of color make less tips than white folks when they're servers, wondering if you talked about that from the perspective of women of color making even less money and enduring more sexual harassment as tip workers. Mm -hmm. That is something that we started talking about and have not done intensive research into, but the fact that there is a clear link between sexual harassment and economic impact on women and that women are more likely to leave their jobs if they experience sexual harassment and that tipped workers are um, particularly, you know, like in a restaurant are experiencing sexual harassment often on a daily basis. And um, so that is definitely linked. I can't give you numbers mm -hmm. for what that, what the results are, but it's a um, growing concern too. Several of our commissioners have raised that as um, an area that we need to focus on to get some more of that specific data. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Representative Reed. Thanks, Karen. Um, when you um, throw out those numbers of 33% of one of those that raises, how was that phrased? Can you read that? that? So that was national data yeah. that estimated that um, an increase of $15 minimum wage by 2024 would result in 33 Three, is that what I said? Thirty-three percent of women are <coughs> being raised. Okay. At fifteen. Fifteen by twenty twenty-four. Okay. You have a comparison for if it didn't go to fifteen, but just follow the. I think it's no. The way it is now, it gets to twelve, sixteen. I think it is. Right. Okay. No. Okay. 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 Thank you. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Chris. Thank you. Um, our next witness is by phone. And that is uh, Lisa Fontaine, who's the owner of a general store in Benson. Issues. However, I feel I need to step up 
to the plate about raising the minimum wage and its effect, you know, on small businesses such as my general store. You know, I don't think you're considering how raising the, or maybe you, I feel that you need to consider how the minimum wage will affect the bottom line of small retail businesses, you know, so that we can continue to be profitable, you know, without reducing staff, raising or, um, you know, raising costs or reducing the hours of operation. You know, the type of business that we have, I, I can't just get a self-checkout like McDonald's is doing or Walmart, you know, that would help me reduce the number of employees so I can maintain, you know, being profitable if this increase happens. Um, currently, we have four full-time employees and three part-time employees. If, um, you know, the part-timers get raised to 15 an hour, then the full-time, they're going to have to be at least 17 an hour. Um, which I can't afford unless I raise the prices of the products. And, you know, for instance, I, I have milk that I pay for 25 a gallon, you know, wholesale. And when I sell it, I can't sell it for more than that. I sell it for $5 a gallon, you know, which is about a 10% profit. The 75 cents that I make um, is split between labor, mortgage, the cost to keep it cold. You know, with the minimum wage increase that is being proposed, you know, employers face an additional 13 to 15 percent in payroll taxes on top of every dollar that the wages are increased. We work on a very, you know, fine profit margin and uh, when it comes to our retail in Vermont, and unfortunately that will, in fact, will affect our employees, you know, the most. Um, <coughs> we, you know, um, Unfortunately, it will affect the employees, and if I'm paying 15 an hour, how much more do you think I can raise the, the cost of milk and other products? If I'm too high, then I won't sell any milk, therefore I'll have to reduce the number of employees. I can't stay in business if I'm not making money. Um, as a matter of fact, over the weekend, I had to raise my deli prices in order to offset the last price uh, pay increase. At what point will I lose business because my prices are too high? You know, I value my employees and want to be able to keep them working, but I need to be able to afford to pay them. With the proposed increase, it will be difficult. I do not feel that increasing the minimum wage will help anyone because it will drive up the cost of living and you will actually find more people in the unemployment. Um, as we are forced to reduce the workforce in order to remain profitable with such a small margin that retail businesses make, According to my accountant, a small business such as myself averages about a 2% profit. Um, and just for the record, if I could afford to pay my employees $15 an hour, you wouldn't be telling me that I need to do it. You know, I appreciate my employees, you know, and at this time I feel like I can't run my business without them. But if I'm forced, then I'll have to find a way to run my business without the people I value. And currently, my husband and I don't even make minimum wage, you know, when you calculate how many hours that we work, you know, to offset some of the hours and, you know, you don't think we'd like to make 15 an hour? <laughs> and, you know, it, it's just, I, I'm just praying that the committee looks at how it will affect small retail businesses and a vote against this wage increase. You know, I don't feel that it will help the economy and small businesses such as myself. I mean, my husband and I have been even talking about, all right, if this goes through, do I now quit and go find a job someplace else so I can offset and keep our business running? We're not doing this to get rich. We're doing this because we love what we do. We love our customers and, you know, love being able to hand a paycheck over to our employees. In fact, two of them make more money than my husband and I do. And at 15 an hour, it's just... I don't see how we can continue doing what we're doing right now. So, you know, I really hope that you guys, you know, take how, you know, you don't see my bottom line. You don't see my $2,000 electric bill in the winter, uh, the summer, and all of our expenses, the insurance, the taxes, and whatever. And 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 now you want to tell us that we need to pay higher because. Honestly, if I could afford 15 an hour, they would be getting it because I value them. So, you know, I, I'm not sure, 
where you guys are going with this, um, but I don't think minimum wage at 15 an hour is, is the right answer. And, and I truly appreciate you guys allowing me to, you know, get on the phone and speak with you guys. And, you know, uh, there are so many other points that I can bring up, but I know you guys have, you know, lots of other people that want to speak. And, you know, if anybody wants to contact me individually, I, I would love to talk to them. Okay. We, we have a question here sure. from Representative Smith. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I don't, I'm not very familiar with the town of Benson or how big or how small it is, but are there other businesses in town that feel the same way that you do about this or have you um, communicated? I, with I would say other? yes. We have another general store in town. We have a, a restaurant. We're only a town of about a thousand people. Okay, thank you. Lisa, thank you very much for weighing in with us. Okay, and, and if anybody would like to call me, they can call me directly if they want to know more, um, or my husband, because we have a lot of, you know, valid points. We've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> so. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank Take you. Care. Yep, bye-bye. <coughs> Thank you. Um, first of all, for the record, my name is uh, David Snedeker. I'm the executive director of the Northeastern Vermont Development Association, uh, the regional development corporation that serves the Northeast Kingdom. And I'm also currently the chair of the regional development corporations of Vermont, of which there are 12 statewide. So, uh, many examples I give in my testimony, which I'll, I'll probably follow, uh, comes from my experience in the Northeast Kingdom. So uh, we, can, we can understand that. So first of all, thanks to your uh, committee for taking testimony on this important issue. Um, the regional development corporations every month have been hearing from many businesses about their concerns regarding an increase of the minimum wage uh, to $15 an hour. We feel obliged to inform the legislature of these business concerns, uh, and there are a number of economic considerations at play here, and we believe, it's, um, we believe that by bringing these to your attention, we can help inform the policy discussion. Uh, Vermont is experiencing a, experiencing a period of historically low unemployment. As a result, businesses are making significant investments in workforce training to improve skills of new workers from the shallow pool of applicants that they see. Uh, notably, many businesses are also making investments in automation. Uh, in my region, we see businesses such as cheesemakers now buying equipment that replaces the jobs people had for turning and washing cheese. Uh, we have metals manufacturing companies that are moving to more um, automated robot systems uh, also to increase productivity for their business, but it also replaces workers. So I think a change could potentially um, accelerate automation for some employers. Uh, many employers, particularly in the manufacturing sector, are concerned about the potential impact of increasing the minimum wage and the upward pressure this would place on the wages of existing workers, other existing workers and the effects on their ability to find a qualified workforce. Uh, some businesses that are located in border communities uh, will have the option to move investments in employment um, <coughs> across the border. In my region, for instance, uh, we have uh, companies like Ethan Allen that have a plant in Orleans and Beecher Falls, but they also have plants in North Carolina where this is not an issue, and Honduras where it's certainly not an issue. Um, NSA Industries, which is a metals manufacturing company in St. Johnsbury, recently uh, constructed a, a plant over in, across the river in New Hampshire. And New Hampshire is also not pursuing this uh, initiative right now for a higher minimum wage. So there's certainly the ability for some companies to shift work to areas where the workers may be not be, be uh, paid as highly. Uh, also, um, we've had a number of Quebec business, businesses come to our region over the last few years. And a lot of these companies have, have their parent facilities in Quebec. In talking with these companies, it's um, my understanding that this $15 an hour issue or wage issue was defeated in Quebec. So um, it, I think these companies with parents in Quebec, should something happen in Vermont, they could also shift work back to Quebec. Um, small businesses in retail, hospitality, and tourism currently employ the majority of minimum wage workers. These sectors already operate on thin margins or at thin margins 
and are extremely susceptible to economic variances. In our conversations with small business owners, <coughs> many clearly state they do not have the ability or desire to simply increase pricing um, to support increasing the wage of their employees. Some explained that they may have to reduce their current workforces to remain viable. Uh, youth employment has been identified as necessary to create the workforce of tomorrow. Vermont has many programs being implemented um, attempting to induce, introduce students to career paths here in Vermont. A student's first job is a critical step and also a stepping stone in learning how to be an effective and productive employee. Businesses have raised concerns that they may no longer be able to provide youth employment opportunities for entry-level jobs at the wages being contemplated. Uh, while wages are a critical component to economic welfare, we asked the legislature to consider the cash value of benefits. Employer-provided health care, paid sick days, vacation time, and more has a significant benefit and cost. Businesses are concerned that the wage pressure created by significant increases to the minimum wage will force them to reduce employer contributions to the employee benefits package. Uh, finally, the regional development corporations have questions on how the increase in the minimum wage will impact state economic development tools. Both the Vermont Employment Growth Incentive and the Vermont Training Program, arguably the two most effective economic tools that we have in the state, are tied to a multiple of the minimum wage. The proposed increase has the potential of significantly diminishing the value and utilization of these programs unless addressed by the legislature. While we fully understand and agree with the desire of the legislature and others to see that all citizens of Vermont have the opportunity for economic security, the business community uh, we support would ask that you also consider the potential impacts across the economy and seek answers that do not uh, negatively impact Vermont's ability to compete for commerce. That concludes my testimony. Questions, Representative Stevens. So, being up in the kingdom, you, talk, you mentioned about going across the companies moving across the border. Yeah. Um, do you find that you have an influx of workers coming in from New Hampshire because the minimum wages are so different that that Vermont companies are attracting uh, or have the choice of more employees because if you can work for seven twenty-five an hour, you can work for ten fifty an hour. At that minimum wage, would you not go across? Come to us. I know there are in, um, New Hampshire residents that are employed in, in Vermont manufacturers, particularly along. We have a lot of manufacturers in the St. John, Bury, Linden area, and uh, you know, just talking to the companies, they sometimes struggle to find people locally. So then they recruit from neighboring New Hampshire. In the Connecticut River, we have a lot of our communities have a lot of close ties, you know, with on both sides. Representative Strong, thank you for coming and representing the Northeast Kingdom. Um, could you, you elaborate a little bit more on the Vermont training program? And you said that's tied to the minimum wage. What is that training program for uh, for Vermonters? Young, I'm guessing younger Vermonters. Yeah, the um, Vermont training program is one of the two major uh, economic tools that we have in the state. And, it's, and basically, it's a um, training monies are provided to a business to train new or existing workers. And there's a wage threshold, which at the end of the training, the worker would need to be paid. Currently, that's just over $13 an hour. And um, those thresholds over the last few years were lowered a bit for rural areas. So we actually have more companies from um, my region and other rural regions participating in these programs than they were previously. So, but the program, program itself covers ha up to half of the employees' wage during the training period. What kind of jobs um, is that training for? A, a wide variety? It's a, it's a wide variety of uh, <coughs> jobs. It can be in any industry sector. And then um, we see a lot of manufacturing companies in our region use it quite a bit. Thank you. You talked about um, opportunities for youth employment. Uh, do, do you know of any businesses that utilize the exemption in the minimum wage laws that allow them to pay uh, students a lesser wage <clears throat> for the bulk of the year? No, I directly I do not know. Thank you. Thank you. That's sufficient. Thank you for having me, Betsy Bishop, with the Vermont Chamber of Commerce. Um, had some good testimony here today and sort of hearing uh, much of what uh, we, we will talk about, but I think it's uh, fair for you folks to know that the Vermont Chamber does share 
your concerns about growing wage disparities in the ability of working Vermonters to earn a living. Um, for us and for the businesses that we represent, we think it's paramount that there's a good balance between our workers and our businesses because without good workers that want to come to work, that put in a eight hour day or more um, and get paid well to do it with benefits, our businesses cannot succeed. So there is a balance that works together with them is something that we're always striving for. But both sides of that equation have to be healthy. Um, so we are, uh, today I'd like to register some concerns about the impacts that we have with increasing the minimum wage at this accelerated pace. Um, the bill before you, S40, uh, represents a 43% increase in wages in, over the next six years on top of a 20% increase that we've had over the last four years. During that same time, we don't anticipate the economy to perform at that same level. We can't always prognosticate into the future exactly how much. We can look at what the economy has been doing over the last number of years. We've seen that uh, economy grow anywhere from 2 to at the high end 3%. So putting wages at that accelerated pace when the economy is not keeping um, track of that is difficult for us. Um, and as for some of you who might not have been part of what I would call the grand agreement four years ago, the Vermont Chamber did support uh, the uh, accelerated pace of minimum wage over the last four years with a fourth and final year going into effect just this past January. That was the 20% increase. So we supported that four years ago. Um, we, we took that agreement seriously. Uh, we supported it at that time, um, and we think that your committee, um, it would be great if you would adhere to that. And um, so we are supportive of increasing the minimum wage. Um, I think you need to hear that, that most of the businesses are supportive of that according to the <coughs> current law that we have now, which that grand compromise was four years of accelerated minimum wage increases and then the next increase would be according to CPI, keeping in line with the economic growth that I mentioned, that 2 to 3%. So we would like to see, now that we've gone through that accelerated pace, we would like to see the minimum wage uh, increase at the level of CPI in accordance with the current law. Um, I think one of the other things that was brought up by the store owner and some of the other uh, business folks that were in the room is that it's not just about minimum wage. There is a cumulative impact of costs that businesses have to bear. Some of them are mandated by new bills in the, in the government. Some of them are just the cost of doing business that you may or may not really um, be able to put a, put a dollar number on. But we see those as, um, thinking about from a business's perspective and how they're going to pay for increased wages, even the CPI or the, the past wage increases that we've seen. I think businesses are really looking at, okay, so what are the, if the wage goes up, what else do I pay that's attached to that wage? The unemployment insurance rate, the workers' comp insurance rate, um, the, um, the, the payroll taxes, the federal tax, um, and they're also trying to do their best in um, supplying benefits, just recently going through quite a uh, change in health care benefits and um, penalties that, that were assessed and um, uh, regular increases there as well, just the insurance market increasing. So when you calculate all that together, a dollar in wage, sometimes that can be as much as an additional 25%. It really depends on, it could be more than that. It depends on the business's benefit package and what that includes. Um, I would also like to uh, tell you that the Vermont Chamber supports uh, some of the language around the tip wage that you've talked about. We believe that you should separate that out and keep that at 5.25 an hour. Um, a lot of the conversation that I've heard is about whether or not TIP wage employees deserve uh, that $15 wage. I, I think there's no, or whatever the current minimum wage is, which is $10.50 an hour. I don't think there's a notion about deserving. The law says that if you don't make $10.50 an hour in TIPs, 
with this lower minimum wage plus tips, your employer has to pay you $10.50 an hour or whatever the minimum wage is. There's no dispute about that. So even if you keep it at $10.50 an hour and don't pass this bill and keep that at $5.25 an hour, if it's a slow day at the restaurant and you're not making any tips and you haven't turned those tables, you're going to get paid <coughs> that minimum wage. It's the law. It has to be done. Employers are adhering to that. So even if that increases to $15 an hour is under this bill and you leave the tip wage at $5.25 and it's a slow day, we would have to pay that tip wage worker that $15 an hour. So I think um, that's something that we would encourage you to, to revisit, excuse me, and look at that. Um, so uh, finally, I just have a couple of suggestions that um, I'd like you to think about as you continue to deliberate in this bill. Um, we think that uh, we ought to allow the COLA, the cost of living adjustment, the CPI increase to go into effect and increasing wages in that way in accordance with the uh, economy allowing employers to absorb those wage increases, those giving them some sort of amount of certainty with that. We'd also like you to um, maintain the student exemption that is in that. Representative Stevens, you just asked the previous witness, do you know anybody? We keep looking for those people. Do you pay the student wage? We haven't found them either. But um, I, was, um, I was heartened by Representative Briglin's testimony in your committee a couple weeks ago. Um, and think that probably one of the reasons that there isn't a lot of discussion around the student wage from the employer standpoint is there's a lot of confusion. So I would encourage you to maintain the student exemption and adopt uh, some form of Representative Briglin's clarifying language around that that he has presented to the committee. And then finally, uh, decoupling the basic wage rate from uh, four tipped employees. Thank you. Representative Stevens. Do you have offhand what the the percentage of minimum wage workers in your your client businesses are? I, I do not. It's not everybody. No, it's not. And we've actually had many uh, employers, some who have actually come and testified here, who are already paying above fifteen dollars an hour because the the market demands that we see a lot more activity in that direction in our with our Chittenden County employers than in the rural communities in the rest of the state. Um, and making sure that you can not only attract those employees, but keep them, uh, oftentimes that wage will demand that above that. And, and just a more philosophical question. We talk all the time about, and legislators say the most important thing is jobs, and certainly the chambers agree. What, how would you define, at least in terms of salary, what a good job is not only from the employer's perspective, but from a business owner's perspective. Because we hear, we hear these, we have two sides. I can't live on the amount of money that I'm getting paid at this minimum level. And business owners are saying, I can't keep my business going unless I have, you know, can pay at this lower level. And that, to me, is really the biggest canyon between the, this, in this conversation. And you, you've represented the chamber for such a long time. It just, it's it's an interesting conundrum that you bring up, and it, it goes along with the um, other issues that we're wrestling right now with as well, which is um, we hear from um, employers that they have all these jobs opening and can't find people to fill them. And then we hear from people, I, I can't find a decent job. Um, so there are these things that are happening, including what, what you're talking about, what is a good job. Um, I don't have a a strong pat answer for that to respond immediately, but I'll give you some of my thoughts since you asked. Um, I think wage does come into that. I think benefits come into that, and I think what a good job is is different for uh, individuals. I've had a series of jobs over my lifetime. I think somebody was talking about what it's like to be a wait staff person, and those people, um, if you've ever been a <laughs> Wait staff person, it stays with you for the rest of your life and you become a good good tipper in your future. There used to be a little little restaurant here on the corner called the Stockyard many years ago where I got my start. And it was a horrible job because it was such hard work. But I think that at that time it was a good job for me. I learned a lot. Um, I I made tips, 
I uh, you know, was able to make a wage. I wasn't looking to live on that wage. But for me at that time, that was a good job for a different reason than um, other jobs. So I think depending on where you are, and that I don't think it is just salary, although I do think that is an important component. I think work environment is something that people are looking for as well. You know, how do I balance that? Um, having a work-life balance also, is my employer flexible and can be flexible? What are the benefits being offered here? Perhaps this job I get a higher salary, but over here I get no 401k contribution or no health care benefit. So there's a lot of things that go into that. Or maybe this is a job that doesn't have a high salary, but I'm going to stick it out for two or three years and learn something so I can get to that better job that I want. I think it really is a philosophical discussion. And my guess is if you ask everybody here about do they have a good job, it's going to depend on many different factors. Strong. Yes, thank you, Betsy. And we had the um, Lake Champlain Regional Chamber of Commerce testifying, and of course that's Shipton County, um, which has, I think, quite a significant different impact than the Northeast Kingdom. So you, you represent a lot of different chambers, and so that particular opinion from that group, is that is it a diverse opinion in the different chambers regionally? So just or? to be very clear, um, I don't represent any other chambers but the Vermont Chamber. The way the chamber um, chambers work in this state, we have about 35 different chambers of commerce, and they're all independently owned. There's no like parent-child relationship. Okay. Um, and we all have independent boards that are governed by you know, local <coughs> people. So my territory is the state, um, mm -hmm. so you're absolutely right. I have a very diverse uh, group of people, everybody from um, restaurants to manufacturers, um, retail, um, education, healthcare. It's, it's, so there's not one, mm. one area to look at. In my formal written comments that I will submit, there's a couple of examples from employers from, that have actually written in to me about um, specifically how they, they will look at this. Um, so I think, you know, I hear different things from each of those industries as well as regions. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. Representative Christie. Hi, Betts. Um, thanks for coming. Um, when you do your, uh, uh, your disaggregation of your data uh, from the different numbers, um, if you wouldn't mind uh, looking at some of those other sectors. Uh, it, it seems that, um, you know, and it, it isn't just, uh, um, it, an anomaly, it's just that, you know, the restaurant business seems to be, you know, what we've been here for, who we've been the most from, uh, but to get uh, that perspective of uh, the downtown uh, small business, the uh, little retail shop, you know, on the corner. The repair facilities, you know, things of that sort, you know, will just be helpful. You know? And I, I do think those businesses, I think you're hearing a lot from restaurants around one section of S40, which is that tip wage. Um, and I've heard from many of them that um, they're not, some of them are not concerned about the overall wage rate, but they're concerned about that tip wage. Um, I think. Um, those small businesses are the ones who are least apt to show up here and, and talk. I was pleased to hear the woman who called in uh, from the local store. Um, I think that's helpful. We hear that perspective a lot. Um, and I, what, what else we hear from sort of what I would call those Main Street type businesses is, you know, it's hard enough to stay in business with all of these things and fighting the big guy, whoever the big guy is in town, you know, they'll, I'll, they'll remain nameless, but there's often a larger store somewhere nearby, and they're trying to maintain that vibrancy of the downtown with that local store flavor. So thank you, I'll, I'll definitely be able to segment that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Betsy, thank you. Thank you. Aaron Seekers. Lots of testimony today. Yes. <laughs> um, I guess I should have coordinated a little bit with you because uh, I have some of the same information, so I'll try and do my best to spare you repeating that information. Um, for the record, Erin Segrist with the Vermont Retail and Grocers Association. 
We represent about 700 members across the state, actually a little more. Our membership is inclusive of a variety of business types and models. They're collaborative and extremely diverse. Our members include retail, grocery stores, convenience stores, distributors, food producers, business service members. Um, so first I'd like to take a quick second to share with you a conversation I had with a member um, of this body last week. Um, they told me that their partner had a couple businesses. They said that they treated their employees well and they would make every accommodation they could for their employees, whether it was giving them extra time off, giving them some flexibility in scheduling. And they would even take a pay cut to ensure that their employees could get a pay increase. And I'd like to share with you that that is exactly what a majority of the businesses in this state do. Um, I apologize, I grew up in a small business and I watched my dad do the same, so it's a little personal. Um, but VRGA and Vermont is made up of small businesses that serve as stewards in our community across the state. We support local organizations, they hire young adults with little to no experience and train them with a foundation to move them up in the real world. And quite often, they're working right alongside employees seven days a week. So more often than not, when we talk about increasing the minimum wage, we hear about the impact to employees. However, this mandate would require employers to face an increase of labor costs of nearly 50% over the next six years. Um, unfortunately, inflation is not keeping up with that demand. So businesses, rightfully so, have significant concern when it comes to deciding whether they can continue to employ employees or continue to sustain the business altogether. We can all agree that having more Vermonters earning higher wages is a worthy goal. It is a, it's a goal that everyone shares. However, um, Businesses, again, have growing concerns on meeting these increased demands, such as S40. When the wage increases by a dollar, the actualized, actualized labor cost is anywhere between 12% 12, 12 to 15% higher than that. So $15 minimum wage would actually equal $16.80 per hour. Further, the increase does not take into account the additional benefits that employers and employees negotiate. Paid vacation, additional training, health and dental insurance, etc. Um, I'll skip over some of the, the facts that that's already um, shared. In addition, we're facing extremely low unemployment here in Vermont. And while this is positive news, the simple supply and demand has already increased wages to the point where larger stores are reviewing options to automate and smaller business owners are working longer hours and keeping their most valuable employees. One member shared with me yesterday that Sundays are her day off. However, she's now spending her Sundays sorting bottles and cans because she can't afford to pay someone to sort those bottles and cans. I have members that would like to expand, but they're required to have a certain amount of funds on hand before they qualify for a loan. Expanding means more employees in this state, but they can't do that. When taking into consideration groceries, housing, utilities, transportation costs, Vermont ranks 10th most expensive state to live in in the country. While the latest version of S40 works to address costs of childcare, <coughs> I strongly urge the committee to consider not moving forward with S40 without fixing the institutional issue that is holding most vulnerable Vermonters back, the entire benefits cliff. I have members on a daily basis <coughs> tell me that they've offered their employees a pay increase, a, a promotion, and they come back the next day and say, I can't afford to take it. They're good employees, they want to keep them, but the employees cannot afford it. I, this is a huge issue, and I would ask the committee to sincerely think about the entire benefits club. So that being said, um, some questions, some suggestions for you also to consider. Um, continue with the current law, tying minimum wage to CPI and taking a much deeper and larger look at the entire benefits cliff. Um, I would ask that you consider including a reduction in wage 
Mm -hmm. If an employer offers a combination of employer-sponsored benefits, which may include health insurance, retirement benefits, time off, in excess of what is already required by, by the law, etc. Many businesses have reported that they offer and match retirement funds for employees. Um, many have told me that if the, in, if the wage increases over the next six years, this, the retirement fund is certainly in jeopardy of disappearing for these employees. And I would ask you to maintain the student exemption currently under under uh, Section 21 VSA 383, so currently in law. Or consider tra a training wage that would allow less skilled employees the opportunity to gain employment at a rate that employers can comfortably afford. So maybe they start at a lower rate, but after six months they go up to the minimum wage. Um, and again, that's only if the committee decides to move forward with increasing the wage. That being said, I will stop there and be happy to take any questions. Questions for Aaron, uh, Representative Stevens. Um, are you aware of any any of your clients who use the training wage or the existing student wage? So, um, yes, actually, Representatives, Representative Brinkland's constituent is a member. Um, and so my understanding of the situation is the gentleman hires um, intellectually uh, challenged, thank you, I lost the word, um, intellectually challenged employees. So they can't live on their own, they're still living at home. Um, they might, you know, they're, they're very competent and hardworking, it's just they might not be able to, um, again, live on their own. And so it's an opportunity for those employees to get out in the community um, while not necessarily being required to have um, a, you know, the, the full responsibility of, of finances on their own. So what, one of the issues that we talk about when we talk about minimum wage or two, the, it's either a training wage, a beginning wage, but the statistics that we also have been that have been shared with us show that you know a large percentage of the people who work for minimum wage are women, and a large percentage of those folks make you know are single moms, et cetera. So they're not beginning. You know, they're, these are jobs that show apparently no income growth. Where are those jobs that show no income? Who are the companies that 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 show no income growth to people with families, and you know, so that it makes it. I mean, this is, these are the things that we try to balance, again, with the real-life problems of the workers versus the real-time needs, as you've described them, as, as, uh, of the employers. Mm -hmm. um, but if I, if I read a statistic that says 58% of the, the minimum wage workers are women, adult women, and that most of the minimum wage workers are over 30, that's not a training wage or that's not a starting wage. That's kind of a real existing thing. Yeah, and, and a lot of those are in the service industry where you represent. So how do we how do we balance that reality with with this other one that says you know we can't afford to pay more? So that's a fantastic question. Um, I personally don't know where those job, jobs are. However, I think it's something. It, it goes back to the enforcement issue. You know, if, if you're um, if you're not treating your employees well, and there's there's not the ability for them to move up, then um, we can't enforce that by increasing the minimum wage. We need to um, encourage businesses to be allowing those employees to gain more training. We should be encouraging those businesses to allow them to move up. That's another point I would like to make actually is um, a majority of the stores in this state are owned by independent operators. Um, if we increase minimum wage to $15 over the next six years, a majority of those larger stores have the capability of selling off to large corporations that may not um, support employees in the essence that this body would like to see, which would only disenfranchise more mothers or more women who are stuck in those jobs. The state has uh, made an effort to do some workforce development and workforce training. I think that 
we as a state need to take advantage of that. We need to be coordinating more um, uh, proficiently and it shouldn't be state versus employee or state versus employer. We should all be working together to move those people up and out of those same positions. But it's not something that we can legislate them out of. And can you get a bit maybe enlarge on that and just give maybe some examples of um, I mean, you know, seventh generation is not a minimum wage paying company, but they were bought by Unilever and the business is growing. It's a stable. But I don't want to drop any names, but you know, um, if you're a convenience store, you know, um, there are three, there are four <coughs> rather large chains in the state, all owned by Vermonters. Um, we all need gas. There's always interest in, in buying up those convenience stores. And it could be a, a, a multinational corporation who comes in, you know, and does the basic that they need to do. They'll automate. They have the funds to, to automate. So that, again, eliminates jobs. Um, we are pushing businesses to the point where they are considering selling their businesses. and. In business, you sell to the highest bidder, or you sell to the next person that knocks on your door. And that might not be the same type of business owner that this body is expecting to have in the state, or would like to have in the state. I think we all would like to have those, those business owners that care for their employees, that move them up in the ranks, but, but we need to understand that if we're selling businesses off to you know, outside corporations, that they might have different, um, a different mentality. Mm -hmm. right, thank you. Representative Smith. Thank you, Aaron. Would it be safe to assume that the Vermont Retail Grocery Association doesn't go along with this bill or does go along with this bill? Uh, we oppose this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Thanks, Aaron. I, I'm very tempted to keep rolling through our, our, our witness list. We have three three people that I know of. Although I'm also aware that we've been going for over two hours. We, okay, I hear a call for the five minute break. Okay, please, please stay with us and remember to try to get back in five. Uh, William Moore. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, for the record, my name is William Moore. I'm the president of the Central Vermont Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we are basically the chamber for Washington County and uh, a little bit beyond. We have service members throughout the state, but generally in Washington County. And we're here to be uh, respectfully urge you to reject S40. We'll go right up the front there. Your question, what's our position? We oppose it. Uh, we did support the current law back in 19, uh, excuse me, 2014 when it was adopted. Uh, and we believe that that's the way to go because it does have the, the incremental increase based on our cost of living. I've previously submitted my statement to you, so I'm not going to read it. I encourage you to, to please do read it because it is brilliant. Um, but what I'd like to say is simply... And especially like page three, thank you. <laughs> I like page five, it's even better. <laughs> But there are some points that I do want to make, and th that includes that uh, minimum wages are generally those at the entry level. Obviously, there are some that are not at the entry level, but generally they're considered that. And the minimum wage was never intended to be a livable wage or a living wage. It was actually created in order to prevent employees from being exploited. Uh, and it was back in the Depression. Uh, we're concerned that uh, the increase um, proposed go beyond what the intent of minimum wage is. A uh, study of the, by the U.S. Department of Labor shows the median hour wages in all occupations in Vermont in 2016 uh, was um, 1823 per hour, while the mean hourly wage stood at $22 an hour. So what that indicates is that most employers are paying at or above the current minimum wage which is 10.50 they're paying at or above the $15 minimum wage. What that means is the market is driving wages. 
And in order to get employees, employers are paying a higher wage to have them uh, come work for them. Um, there have been studies conducted and, you know, that indicate what the impacts of increase in minimum wage are. And I think one that's very telling was done by uh, the Heritage Foundation in 2016. I'm going to read it because I, I find it very important. It says that starting wages of $15 per hour mean full-time employees must create at least $38,700 a year in value for their employers, including wages, employer payroll taxes, Affordable Care Act mandated penalties. Such a high hurdle would make it much harder for less experienced and less skilled workers to find full-time jobs. Many of these workers are not yet productive enough to create that much value for their employees, for their employers, and businesses simply want to hire them at a cost. That's the effect of a $15 minimum wage. Is the employee producing that type of income to the business, or is the business actually going to be operating at a loss? Um, other studies that have been conducted include one on uh, Seattle by the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, minimum wage increases wages in low-wage employers, evidence from Seattle, done in, uh, last June. Seattle, as you may know, has passed legislation which would increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour. And what they found was that uh, they, they, this study is significant because it looks at all sectors of the economy. It didn't just look at restaurant workers as most other studies have looked at. This looked at wages across the board. And what they found was that at $13 an hour, it's having a, low, it's having a huge impact on low-wage workers due to fewer hours being offered those employees. Uh, their study showed the result because of raising the minimum wage above $13 an hour, uh, there was a rough loss of roughly $125 per month due to working fewer hours. I've seen some uh, studies that indicate that the lost hour could lead to actually wages uh, loss of approximately $171 a month. Uh, so it does have an impact. But what we, what we think is that we need to create a workplace that is assured the productivity is commensurate to the increases in the minimum wage. And what that means is focusing in on education and training. Education and training are the keys to raising wages at all levels. Moving students who may not be college bound to technical and apprenticeship training is vital. Strengthening community college and Vermont uh, Technical College will present better opportunities for those looking for higher paying careers. Improving access to vocational technical education at the secondary level is critical and requires untangling a complex network of funding and administration to become a barrier to providing what students and employers need. There are good paying jobs going for the asking in Vermont today. Employers I've spoken with said they're having a hard time filling those jobs because the applicants are not meeting necessary job requirements. That goes to the training issue. There needs to be uh, training. Increasing minimum wage to $15 is a lofty goal, but does not really solve the problem. Training and better education will go a long way to helping to do that. Uh, the studies that have been presented to the assembly indicate that raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour can result in significant job loss across the state of Vermont. We don't think the public policy should encourage loss of jobs in Vermont. Public policy should encourage job creation. So with that, I'll close my comments and be happy to take any questions you might have. Questions? Representative Stevens? No, I, I, I appreciate your point of view and then, you know, the, the idea that um, I, I asked a question earlier uh, from the central or from the Vermont Chamber, and I'll ask you. How, how do we define what a good job is if you're a worker, if you're an employee, and if you're a business person? And I totally buy into the idea of education. Um, we've brought companies into the state, and I think of Bennington as a, a recent example, where their aerospace industry jobs or, or high-tech uh, manufacturing jobs, and when they've left, leaving behind skilled workers in that trade, 
they've also said we're not leaving because it's too expensive. We're leaving for other reasons, and we don't know exactly what they are. So we we we've educated people, and then boom, jobs are gone. And I'm just curious to know how what what is the interplay between in your opinion, between what that good job is for someone who's gotten educated and is making more, far more than the minimum wage, it makes a good job, as opposed to what an employer needs, what their needs are both economically and in order to attract skilled workers. That is a good question, and it's a difficult one. Uh, a good job to some may not be a good job to others. I, mean, I always told people, if you're not happy in your job, leave. <laughs> that's, 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 to them, that's not a good job. It's a good paying job. But it may not be a good job that's a good fit for them. Um, it's not a good answer either. Uh, a good job is something that encourages somebody to be productive, that contributes to the organization that they're working for, that allows them to contribute to their family, to bring up a family, to provide for housing, and all of those good things that one wants to do. But there's different ways of setting what those wage rates ought to be. And the wage rates, we believe, should be set by the market. That if I'm offering, if I'm in a tight job market and I need a, somebody who's going to mop floors at $15 an hour, I'm probably going to mop the job, mop those floors myself because I don't think that's an appropriate pay level for mopping floors. So it, it all depends on what the level of the job is, what the work requirements are, what the training requirements are, and what the return to the, the organization is. I mean, our organization, we're a small business. We have, um, right now we're down to three, we're looking to hire a fourth person. Nobody's earning minimum wage. We provide some benefits to those employees. And I still can't find, I'm, I'm looking to fill a sales slot, and I can't find anybody to find that slot. And we're offering some fairly good wages for that, along with the benefits. So I, I think it's a good job. Evidently, other people don't think it's such a hot thing to be looking for. So it's all in, in, in what the employee perceives it to be, what a good job is. Some people are very happy at a $13 an hour job, they're able to succeed and get what they want. Others are not. Other people are not happy at a $50 an hour job. I, I, I've got a sister who's an attorney. She makes significant money on an hourly basis. She's not really happy. She's a sole practitioner. She's a one-man, you know, one one arm paper hanger. So is, is she really happy at work? I don't know that. I, I suspect she enjoys the law, but I suspect she doesn't enjoy it being a one-person office, what it entails. And so for employers deciding what the market is for uh, someone who's mopping the floor, does that, do they include what the market is to live, including what rent is, what food is, what, what other expenses might be? And then say, well, this this guy needs to tie him off the floor, and he needs fifteen dollars an hour to pay for all those. I mean, are those calculations that you that you bring in as well? They, they are looked at. Obviously, they're looked at because one of the things that happens is when you take somebody on, you're onboarding. The question you're going to train them, and you're really not going to recapture that for more than a year. So you want people that are going to be long-term employees, mm -hmm. and in order to have long-term employees, you want to make sure that compensation is fair. It's just, and it's something that they can continue on. So yeah, those factors are considered very serious. And also, what are other jobs of a similar vein? Hey. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Glenn Foster. Good morning. Good morning. Glenn Foster uh, with Columbia Forest Products in uh, Newport. Just a little uh, history of the company that I represent. Uh, Columbia Forest Products has been a, a the, the, the mill itself has been a fixture in Newport since 1945. Uh, in 1966, it became under various uh, ownership since in 1966 at uh, Columbia Forest Products. Uh, during the 1980s, uh, it had become a private company at that point. Uh, the owners decided to sell the company to the employees. So since the 1980s, Columbia Forest Products is a 100% employee-owned company. Uh, the, the company itself has two divisions, a, a veneer division and a plywood division. Uh, the Newport facility is part of the veneer division, which consists of four plants. The one in Newport, we have one in Maine, Wisconsin, and 
uh, the province of Ontario. Uh, the division headquarters for the mayor division is also in Newport. The, the facility itself, the mill, employs about 160 people currently. Uh, they're looking now to hire another 10 or 12 uh, folks. And the division office, of which I am a part, uh, employs another 16 people. Uh, that's sales, accounting, uh, other administrative people that constitute that office. Uh, myself, you may be wondering why an engineer is coming to talk about and concerns about this particular bill. Uh, I've been with the company 22 years. Uh, 16 years of that was, uh, was manager of the, the Newport uh, Mill facility. Uh, the last several years I moved to the division office in an engineering capacity, uh, so I do have some responsibility for the other three non-Vermont mills in, in my role in the division. Uh, the plant currently has an average hourly wage of about $16 an hour. Our loading is 75%. So in order for us to pay that average wage of $16 an hour, it costs the company about $28 an hour. The wages uh, range from about $13.50 is the lowest wage that we have up to close to $30, depending on the nature of the job the experience. So what we found uh, is that in order to attract and retain employees, we have to pay a premium over the local uh, prevailing wages, particularly for the entry-level workers. Um, if the minimum wage is 10.50, which it is now, or our, our lowest wage is 13.50, that might uh, suggest a premium of about three dollars an hour. That premium exists because the manufacturing environment, the shift work we do, the rather rigid schedules that we have is not for everybody. You know, so for us to compete with other jobs, which some people might perceive as easier work, more flexible schedule, we have to pay more to attract those folks. Uh, so while the minimum wage may not affect us directly, I think it, it does and will have a significant indirect impact uh, on the mill. Uh, it'll have a ripple effect. You know, uh, if the low wage is forced to go up to, to attract those folks that now can make uh, more than ten fifty up to fifteen dollars an hour, then we're going to have to raise our lower wages uh, again uh, to establish that premium to attract the folks. And even the pay structure within the mill, we have several different levels between thirteen fifty and thirty dollars. That is all going to go up as well. As an example, if um, our hourly uh, rates increase by say three dollars per hour. Last year, that would have cut the mill's profits in half at three dollars an hour. So you may say, "Well, so your profits are less than half of what they were." Uh, the, what the company does with its profits really boil down to two things: the company can reinvest better equipment, updated things, better working conditions, whatever that reinvestment might look like. Uh, but the other part of profits use is to buy back uh, shares that the employees have been granted over their years of employment. That's how the ownership works. When they leave the company, the, the, the company has to have money to, to buy their shares back. So when they leave, and we hope they leave because of retirement, not for some other reason, that's what that money is used for, to pay their, basically their retirement nest egg that they've developed over their years of employment. So if those profits are impacted, which they would be if we're forced to pay higher uh, labor wages, <clears throat> that means less money to invest in the Newport facility. It means that any potential growth, instead of going to the Newport facility, might go to the Maine mill, might go to the Wisconsin mill, may go to the Ontario mill that has lower production costs and uh, higher profitability. And it also means if bad times come, which I'm sure they will again, uh, we were significantly impacted by the recession of 2008-2009. Uh, uh, that means the highest cost mill, which could be Newport, is going to be the first to be redu uh, reduced. That's going to feel the impact of any, um, any downturn in the economy. Columbia Forest Products does not have any customers in Vermont. It does not have any competitors in Vermont. So we're not in the same boat as some of the testimony you heard earlier. Well, everyone else's prices are going to go up too. So we're going to, you know, we're not going to be in any different situation relative to our competitors. 
For us, that's completely different. You know, our competitors are in different states, different countries. Our biggest competitor is actually a Canadian facility called Commonwealth Plywood. They only have one facility in the U.S., and that's in Whitehall, New York. So I guess my message is, if, uh, if you have an interest in seeing the Newport facility to continue to be a viable uh, part of the economy in Newport and Orleans County, then you will allow the minimum wage to increase with the consumer price index, as is the current law, and not accelerate it anymore. Thank you for being here. Uh, can you tell me what the employee uh, retention is at Columbia? It's probably pretty good, isn't it? Well, it's, uh, as far as turnover goes. Overall, the turnover is probably around 10 to 15 percent, but it's uh, very, very, very low uh, on the senior employees because they have a vested interest. They have yeah. a lot of retirement money built up. Uh, so for the more senior employees, it's um, it really is retirement. Most of the turnover of that, that generates that average of 10 to 15 percent of the employees that come and go. They work for six months, they work for a couple of years, and then. It amounts to a pretty great retirement plan for someone that's been there for a while, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Representative Strong. Thank you for coming. And you made an interesting point that I don't think we have heard that Columbia Forest Products is tied to other um, economies outside of our state. So basically what you're saying is if we increase the minimum wage, your competitiveness decreases in the state of Vermont? Yes. Uh, right now, of the four mills, there's only one that operates three sh a full three shifts. That's a Wisconsin plant. Newport is at uh, about two and a half shifts. Our third shift is sort of a skeleton crew. Uh, the main facility is at two shifts, and the Ontario facility is only two shifts. <coughs> so the company has options to uh, expand elsewhere where it might be more profitable to do so. Mm -hmm. okay. Sorry, just to follow up, I just want to make clear. So, is it, it's um, the labor costs themselves? So, if uh, I just want to get that in context with labor costs, uh, is that what you're saying? Is that if our labor costs go up, Vermont becomes less profitable? Obviously, than it is now, I know, but it's also less profitable. I mean, the, is, is labor costs in comparison to the other other facilities? Is that what we're talking about? The labor costs would be cheaper in Wisconsin on the third Relatively shift? Relatively speaking, if, if, uh, if our labor costs are escalating at a faster rate than our sister mills. Okay, that's what I was yes. trying to So it is because of labor costs. Okay. Yeah, labor is about one third of our total cost. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel Barlow. Good morning. Good morning, committee. For the record, uh, Dan Barlow, public policy manager with Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility. And uh, we are here today in support of S40, and our support does not come with uh, caveats or carve outs. Um, for 28 years, VBSR has been talking about what a good job means in Vermont. And uh, that has uh, been an evolving position at times. Um, uh, broadly speaking, uh, for us, a good job uh, is a job that pays a living wage, uh, that a person can um, bring home a salary that allows them to live without public benefits uh, and allows them to uh, cover their household expenses uh, and save for a future. Uh, additionally, we think the benefits surrounding a job are also incredibly important. Uh, Employer-sponsored health insurance is a big part of that. That's a big cost for businesses. Um, a flexible work schedule, paid time off, whether it's paid sick days or uh, paid family leave, uh, these are all these, what we see as essential elements for a good job. Uh, and you know, um, different circumstances for different individuals, maybe uh, they would rather have a flexible work schedule rather than uh, some extra time off, you know? So uh, allowing the employer to make those decisions around the edges to make uh, um, a job work for an individual. Uh, but I think it's really important to talk about what, what is a good job, uh, because often we find uh, that there are jobs out there that are highlighted as good jobs that really when you dig beneath the surface, you find that they are not really actually working for Vermonters. 
Um, so uh, BBSR has been looking at this issue around the minimum wage for about the last year and been having some pretty serious conversations internally with my public policy committee uh, and my board of directors uh, about how to address income inequality um, and also uh, but within the scope of uh, the, the, um, the benefits that employees, employers are already paying for um, and um, how to do that on a timeline that's going to work broadly for a large part of the economy. And uh, you know, I'll be frank, I have a few board members who will, uh, would tell me that uh, our position is actually a little wimpy, that uh, they want uh, $15 an hour in 2020, uh, that we think they should, we should move very swiftly uh, to, uh, to a livable wage. Uh, I have other uh, employers who I, I sat down with them and, and uh, you know, we looked at what they pay right now, what their scale might be over the next few years, and they quickly realized that they would already be at $15 an hour uh, over the next few years and quickly became very comfortable with the timeline that the Senate uh, had put forward. Um, so we do think you know, a uh, six-year timeline, broadly speaking, works for um, uh, most employers uh, out there in our economy. Uh, and we think that's the direction that the legislature should take. Uh, and I, I, I do want to note that, again, I have some members who, uh, who want this committee to move you know, faster and farther uh, than that. Uh, so within BBSR, and we have 700 businesses across the state, uh, there's some diversity uh, and opinion of how quickly we move there. Uh, there wasn't a lot of diversity and opinion about whether or not we actually make this move. Um, I know prior witnesses have talked about uh, the economic impact on Vermonters of raising the minimum wage. They've talked about the profile of who is making a minimum wage. It's not high school students. It's often breadwinners for families. Um, and that's why it's important to address income inequality there. Um, but we also think um, it's important to talk about um, the, um, the intersection between our failing health care system and the suppression of wages over the years. And um, uh, from BBSR's perspective, this, has been, uh, this really suppresses wages uh, and, and affects decisions on both the employer and the employee side. Uh, the person I'd like to talk about is uh, small, uh, Don Mayer, the owner of Small Dog Electronics. I think a lot of folks probably know him. He is at Vermont Public Radio uh, over in Waitsfield, South Burlington, and I think he has a few other locations as well. Um, he believes strongly that his employees should make a living wage. And uh, over the years, he has been slowly increasing the, his starting wage. And by 2020, uh, his lowest paid employee will be making $15 an hour. Uh, and that, that was really important to him. And, and I was talking to him this week. And he's already seen the impact in certain sectors of his business where maybe he had problems retaining an employee. And as soon as he starts increasing those wages, uh, that retention problem goes away. The employees stay longer. They're more productive. Uh, and he doesn't have to waste time and effort and money uh, hiring a new person and training them up for that position. Uh, so he's personally seen the benefits there. Um, but also, uh, you know, Don Mayer pays uh, for his employees' health insurance. And when he started in business uh, 25 years ago, he could pay for an employee's health care and their family's health care for $1,500 a year. And that cost is now $15,000 a year. And that's about a $7.25 an hour, uh, $7 minimum wage for him. Um, so he's struggling with this, but also believes so strongly that his employees need health care benefits. They need a, a good wage that they can live on, and is making efforts within his organization to move forward on that. So uh, I, I said no caveats, no carve-outs. Uh, we support this bill uh, 100%, but I would also urge the legislature to return to the issue of universal health care. Uh, our fracturing uh, employment system, our employer-sponsored health care system, is holding back our economy. Um, and, and you know, businesses are making tough decisions about um, you know, how they pay for the increase in premiums, and that's money that could go to salary increases too. And meanwhile, on the employee side, a lot of their uh, actual wage increases that they have seen are just gobbled up by their own increased health care costs. And let me just uh, scroll back to one of my previous documents because I found a really interesting study, uh, and this is national language. Um, but it found that um, out-of-pocket health care costs for Americans, between, uh, if they had kept pace between 99 and 2009, um, pretty much erased all those uh, gains in, in uh, salary increases that they saw. Um, and so if, if health care costs had, had maintained in pace with the economy during those years, the average American family would have more than $500 more 
in uh, income, household income, um, but we've seen just all the benefits uh, just eaten up by our healthcare um, system. So um, I wanted to kind of explain what was in the room, in the mix during these conversations. At no point was uh, were we ever going to, you know, oppose a minimum wage increase like this. And in fact, uh, the, the approach the Senate took with a six-year timeline uh, made it a lot easier for some of our members who um, wanted to work up to 15, but weren't quite sure how they could do that over the next few years. And you know, often I don't have to tell this committee, but often you know, when having these conversations, people think it's $15 in 2019. Like that—that's the conversation that this committee is looking at. And you have to sit down and explain to them that uh, it's a longer timeline. And once employers actually look at their uh, how they would be increasing their own wages over the next few years, that they were going to be broadly in pace with that uh, for the most part. Representative Reed. <coughs> Two things. First of all, with the health care, which isn't really germane to this, I think we all agree that it's broken and it's too expensive. Um, uh, another thing, just I guess for clarification, you know, Don Meyer stuff, I know Don, I live right there. He's, he's looking to move small dog out of, I mean, he's got it for sale, so that he can long operations into South Burlington. So before we go beatifying him, Let's just keep that. All right. Secondly, I guess it would be third. And my question, my first question is, what of your members, um, what's the average workforce? The quantity. How many? I'm sorry. What, what's the average quantity of employees work? How many employees? But our our members represent. I don't have that data on hand. Again, about 700 business members. Right. But um, I mean, our average. I mean, our, we have some of the largest corporations in the state who are members, and we also have folks who are making value-added food products out of their kitchen, and they have no employees. So I think our membership broadly reflects the uh, the small business of uh, Vermont for the most part. You know, it's less than 10 employees often. And uh, with all due respect, Representative, um, I have to push back against your statement that healthcare does not impact this issue, because it surely does. And I also don't appreciate uh, you casting aspirations on one of my members who's not here to defend himself. The, the, the first sale signs and terms of business is public knowledge. Okay. Yeah. But Don is invested in Vermont. Yeah, no, He's yeah. a great business owner. I'm just saying. Sure. Okay. He's near retirement age. Yeah, more. Um, also, uh, you know, I, I'm not so sure this reflects a lot of the small rural businesses that are struggling. Sure. Okay. I mean, you represent less than half of 1% of businesses in Vermont, many of which are very small, one, two, three people, like the lady we heard from, from Benson. And it should be noted that, I mean, I know you guys are all about the social responsibility, especially as it's from the public government platform, and that's what you guys are all about. What, what social responsibility is to small businesses is supporting your, your local, you know, your your local arts, your local sports teams, your local high school, these are what are going to go away when your labor costs go up to a point where you, you can't afford them anymore. And I think that needs to be said. Um, you know, none of my members who I've talked to um, have told me that they were going to stop giving to the Little League team if they had to raise their minimum wage. That's something I haven't heard that from the business community. Right, and that's what I'm saying. I think with you representing such a small amount of Vermont businesses, I'm not so sure a large percentage of the smaller rural businesses. And I know you have some of those. We have a lot of those. Do, do we have other questions for, for witness? So when you, you were talking about how most of your the, the committees and the businesses were talking about how once they learned what fifteen dollars an hour meant they didn't it didn't seem to freak them out because of course it's thirty one thousand dollars a year for a forty hour job or adding on the benefits it's one point three whatever whatever ends up being thirty eight thousand by someone else's numbers. How does a bit how do businesses start leading the way? Uh, on this, um, I was doing some reading on Walmart, who is now paying $11 an hour, and, and Target, a big competitor, announced that they're going to get to $15 by 2020. Mm -hmm. 
How does it, is that an attitude that fits with any of your businesses that fed you this information that in your discussions that they don't, do they need us to say it has to be $15 an hour or yeah. can they do it themselves? Um, some are doing themselves and, and I, I want to reflect on uh, the first witness that this committee heard from today. Um, from a three penny tap room who said uh, this is something they want to do um, but by raising you know the floor together as an economy this makes it easier for them to do that uh, to get all their employees to a starting wage of fifteen dollars an hour over the next few years so we have a number of empl uh, employers who are moving to fifteen regardless of what um, the legislature does and then we have uh, another series of employers who want to get there and they recognize that raising the floor on the whole economy will allow them to get there yeah. Yeah. Representative Smith. I think that's great that the businesses do want to pay someone $15 an hour. It's their prerogative as well. But uh, in the Vermont Business for Social Responsibility, do you get up into the Northeast Kingdom at all to be involved with businesses from the Northeast Kingdom? Uh, we do have, have members of the Northeast Kingdom, and I can, um, uh, if you, on our website, we actually list, we're very transparent, we list every single member on our website, and you can go there and divide by, uh, by county and sector uh, as well. So uh, I'd be happy to, you know, sit down and uh, go through a list of uh, some of our Northeast Kingdom members. You know, uh, we do tend to have um, most of our membership being, uh, you know, Chittenden, Washington, and Wyndham County as well. Windsor is also, we have a number of members uh, in Rutland and Bennington. We've seen growing membership there as well. So, um, and um, we're actually looking at opportunities to have more networking get-togethers up in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, so we recognize when we come to these parts of the state and have a uh, evening networking get-together, get bring entrepreneurs and business leaders together, that generates a lot of excitement for, uh, for community members and members of the economy up there. Have you had the opportunity to get their uh, responses at the minimum wage up there versus Chittenden County or? Uh, the, the feedback I've gotten on the minimum wage was has been for all our members across the state. Um, so again, I'll, I'll go through, I can go through and see if there are any particular members, you know, I think you're probably looking for many folks in your district. I you know. online. So on our website, we have, you'll list all our members right there. So uh, it'll, it'll be clear who, you know, we might have in, the, in your district. Great, so, thank you. Yeah. And uh, if there are no other questions, just in closing, again, we think uh, the, the Senate bill, the approach of an uh, increase over six years, that's an appropriate timeline that works for um, broadly the whole economy, uh, businesses of all different sizes and situations. This is, uh, you know, a, a fair way to move um, the economy forward and raise the floor in wages. Thank you. Thank all right. You. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you all this morning yes. for your, your testimony. Um, we will adjourn. The committee will meet after the floor as quickly as possible upstairs. Not here. Not here. The luxury time's over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Back to crap. Back to our regular gigs. Thank you all.